Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the May 28, 2013 Board of Selectmen meeting. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. A little housekeeping first. There are openings on the following committees. The Audit Committee, the Bike Path Committee, the Business Development Commission, the Carver Cultural Council, Carver Housing Authority, we have a state representative, Commission on Disability, Earth Removal Committee, Growers Representative, Local Housing Partnership Committee, Marcus Atwood Trustees, Old Colony Regional Vote Tech School Committee, two positions. We have a Recreation Committee, two positions, Town Building Study Committee, and ZBA alternate. Also, uh, please uh, keep in mind that uh, um, donations for the food pantries can still be made at the Council on Aging and the Public Library. There is still a need uh, that's not going away. So if you could just keep that in the back of your mind. Applications for those other positions, by the way, can be picked up from the uh, Selectman's office. The first item of business tonight is a reappointment of the police chief for up to a three-year term. And as a member of the police department, I'm going to recuse myself completely from the issue and turn it over to the vice chairman. Mr. Vice Chair. Mr. Warren. Uh, I would like to uh, nominate the police chief to be appointed for another three-year term. I'd like to second that nomination. Uh, motion was made and seconded. Any discussion? Well, I just think that uh, we need to encourage the chief to stay here for one thing. Um, we put quite a bit of money out to send him off to the uh, FBI Academy, and uh, I think he's done a good job. He's got a lot of support in the community, and, and I think within the department. So that's why I make that motion. Sarah? I concur. I, I think it would be a mistake not to reappoint him for three years. <clears throat> uh, Rick, has uh, the chief uh, submitted anything I'm writing to you that he's not interested in uh, continuing on? I, I have nothing from the chief seeking not to be reappointed. Has everyone read the contract? Yes. In the contract it says, uh, the chief agrees to remain in the employee of the town and neither accept employment nor be employed by any other employer until such expiration date. It also states, in the event either party to this agreement fails to give written notice of its desire not to extend this agreement or any portion thereof, not less than one year prior to the expiration date, this agreement shall be extended on the same terms and conditions as herein provided all for one additional year. So, in my view, you're, uh, it doesn't end on June uh, 30th, 2013. It's extended out another year to June 30th, 2014, according to the terms of the contract. I understand that, but being appointed as a police officer is under a different statute. There may be some questions as to what my ability is to act as a police officer after June 30th is. So all I'm looking for is appoint me according to the contract. That's all I've wanted. That's it. Well, I'm, I'm just interpreting the contract of what's in there. Neither, neither party gave the one year's notice, which would have been last year at this time, not to extend this contract. So it's extended for another one year. An appointment is different than the contract. Ask a it's question. a totally different statute. Can I just want to, if I want to maybe clarify this, I, I sometimes we're all talking about the same thing in different directions. Um, Mike, your contract extends for two more fiscal years through June 30th of 2015? Mm -hmm. Correct. And are you, uh, Jack, are you talking about a one-year extension from the end of that time frame? That's no, the one-year extension from, mm -hmm. okay, from June 30th, 2013. All right, this is becoming much more confusing than it needs to be. Either appoint me for the next two years, like my contract says, or don't, Jack. I, really, I, this is a simple thing. So I, I don't know, if you want to interpret it that way, fine. 
mm -hmm. then call up uh, Copeland and Page and see what their interpretation is. My interpretation is I need to, to continue as a police officer in the Commonwealth, be appointed again. <clears throat> it's two different, sta it's a statute that's separate from the contract. Well, what, what it is it? It's in the contract. So, uh, mm -hmm. Helen, do you have anything you want to yeah, offer? Yeah, I was going to say, then, I, I would like to hear from Copeland and Page. Um, Mike, first, I want to. Th Thank you. It's unreal. You're not going to let me speak? Look, honestly, this whole situation is it's really getting embarrassing. It's simple. Either appoint me according to the this contract is, or don't. Th this is ridiculous that. I can't even ask questions right now. You can ask questions. And you know what? I'm not going to let. This is a meeting of the Board of Selectmen. That's right. Go ahead, I'm sorry. Thank you, Mike. I'm, I mean, we've always worked well together. And I'm not going to, I'm not going to make a quick decision because the room is filled with people that have disagreements with me. I, I'm truly sorry. And Mike, I do not have any problem with your work. But it is my duty as a Board of Selectmen to know exactly what I am signing off on. And right now, I read this three times over the weekend, well, actually starting last week. And <clears throat> first of all, it was written very clunky, in my opinion. Um, I don't want to get into your contract here, but it, it, it goes into phases, uh, you know, the two years, which you are well aware of. But then it does say that you, if you're out seeking employment, you're supposed to let us know a year in advance, which I think is kind of weird anyway. Do you want to elaborate on that section then? Well, if you want me to, I started looking for employment after I spoke to Mr. Franey a few months ago, and he thought there'd be an issue. You, st you started looking for employment? Is that what you're asking? Yeah, I am. Uh, to be quite frank, I'm a little concerned that Everyone in these high-level positions say they love this town. They do. Can I please speak? No, I go ahead. I'm not stopping you. And I've always, you know, I've had conversations with all of you one-on-one, -on -one, and each one of you have gone out and uh, have looked for jobs without any knowledge until, until it's going to be in the paper that you are a candidate for the position. We're losing the town administrator. I didn't know anything about it. We lost John Adams, I didn't know anything about it. And now you too say you were looking in the town of Hanson. So when I see this, I say, it appears that there's something not, that you're not happy with something in this town. So my thought was, if I read this correctly, and that's the only reason I'm saying, maybe if I speak with uh, Mr. Corbo, that I will have a better understanding of this, is that this contract just automatically, you just automatically continue to be the, the chief of police for one year. And that, listen, that part of the stipulation goes on. That's, that's something to be concerned about a year from now, not now. It, right. It's before my last year. The wording in this contract is not crazy. It's, it's based on a standard contract that the chiefs of police lawyer produces, and most towns do. Mm -hmm. my, can I also make contract is not crazy compared to most chiefs of police. If I could interject briefly, one of the problems here in general is that you have two different statutes. One statute that has to do with the reappointment of police chief under Chapter 97A, I believe, and the other statute that allows for re for for boards of selectmen to contract with police chiefs. Right. And when they came up with when they put that statute into place, probably <coughs> 10 years ago, it didn't dawn on the legislature that it may have may not oh, work conflict. neatly with the other statute. So in order to mitigate that, the contract that, that, that we have with the current and the past police chief um, was to um, basically to give notice of that fact, that, that this is a five-year contract, but the board understands that the chief will have to be reappointed because of this other statute that's in place. So I think at the time it was always uh, thought of as more of a parliamentary Thing, not really a um, as much of a decision as it seems to be being made on this. Um, so that's the problem: is you have two com two statutes that don't really, they're not they're not uh, mutually exclusive, but they don't work well together. So the contract no, no. intended to make them work together. Yeah, as then best I, we could. I think we should have had some guidance from Copeland right. Page before we before it was put in front of us. Helen, are you, are you all finished? Yes. Yeah.
Uh, yeah. I, I just wanted to repeat my motion and it was very simple and it was to the point that it didn't have anything to do with the contract. It said my motion was to reappoint Mr. Mix as our police chief. Reappoint Mr. Mix as our police chief under that first chapter. So uh, did you, did very you, simply did you that say for three stated. years. For three years, yes. But <clears throat> A reappointment has to do, it's all about the contract, and that's, you know. We already signed, I think, okay. a, a three, I mean, a five-year contract. The original contract was a five-year contract, so my, my feelings were that the longest we can reappoint the chief as the chief under that other chapter is mm -hmm. three years. So I wanted to reappoint him under that chapter for three years. We will have to deal with the contract at a later time. Sarah. Thank you. Um, just a couple of things that when we hired the chief, we did get guidance from Copeland and Page. Mm -hmm. They were with us. We negotiated that contract. Okay. So, but you, you said you don't understand why we didn't get guidance. Copeland and Page. No, I, no, I, I didn't say I, that. I, to make this decision okay. now, I wanted guidance so, from say that. Copeland so, and Page. But we did have guidance. Um, and unless there's maybe a fact that some people are missing here that the, if the contract is a five-year contract <clears throat> and we don't reappoint Mike Mix at least for two years, we're going to have to pay him anyway. Mm -hmm. No, we're not. I have three lawyers that say you will. Well, we're not going to have to. And the final point is that as far as the other uh, town department heads are concerned, the town accountant, et cetera, it's my understanding that this board, um, it, it is true that this board is not the appointing authority for those individuals, and I don't, you raised the question as to why they didn't come and tell you. I don't believe they're required to. Not to tell me, but to be more open about it, Sarah. I mean, it was pretty, it was well, pretty no. obvious to everyone here. It's well, not, it's not that, that's a good point. It was pretty obvious to everyone here. We're getting off here. the subject, so. No, but yeah. this is what I, I'm trying to get at in terms of the, the information that I'm getting. It was pretty obvious to everyone here, meaning people who are working in town hall. I am not privy to a lot of information until a very short time before. I wasn't on the selectmen, Sarah. In but Helen, you've been on the board for a year, and I if you had questions, you I could have asked Copeland and Page before tonight. I don't it's just been weeks and weeks I and don't months. Seek opinions with Copeland and Page unless I go through Rick. Well, Rick, this is, I'm here. not going to argue with you. Rick's a town administrator. He's really responsible. And, uh, you asked why you didn't talk to Copeland and Page earlier. I, you've had quite a while, I think. I don't know. That's just my take on it. Yeah, well, <clears throat> nobody has asked for an opinion, but I, 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 I just don't, want an understanding. I'm surprised um, that, we'll put it this way, the language seems relatively clear. That's all. And unless there's a qualitative reason why my chief mix is not the person you want to be police chief. The I don't understand why the board wouldn't reappoint him for concurrent, at the least concurrent with his existing contract, okay. if not for an, a full three-year term that the statute allows. But that's my editorial comment only, so. Are we all done? Are we ready for a vote? Yes. Is this it, on the, I'm just, just I, for, the, for um, Elaine's sake, this is on, on Dick's motion. I would like to explain why I'm a little bit con concerned about the number one. I still, I still don't have a full understanding on this clause about the one year. Number two, I am a little concerned that people in primary positions in this town are seeking other employment and then we find out when they're a contention and I know that you are still, as far as I know, the primary candidate in Hanson, is that true? Yes. And so uh, by giving it, uh, if I understand this of falling into the one year, it gives Mike time to realize whether he wants to stay here. It get, in some, the, there will be a new administration here next year that will be able to follow through and continue on his contract. Am I understanding that correctly, that that's what would happen? I think we need to just bring it to a vote. Helen, what are you comfortable ready? doing, Helen? You're asking me for that. That sounds like a legal question that I, not only that, but I'm a little, I would think that um, the chief would probably have legal input that yeah. may be um, of one nature versus uh, what we might seek. So 
I don't know that we, uh, having a legal debate publicly is going to serve exactly. the town's no. purposes here. Then I would, I would rather table this and uh, fail as you may. I, um, these are big decisions in this town. May I, so I make, I, a, make another comment? Uh, um, and this would be with re regard to positions that, um, that are not directly hired by the Board of Selectmen, meaning the town administrator, the police chief, and the fire chief. Um, there has been some turnover, but realistically, it's my job to make sure that those functions get done. Mm -hmm. And I think we've done that with the board's help very effectively. So, um, and I don't want to minimize the efforts of people and, you know, and, you know, widgetize them into we'll find someone to get it done. But the fact that maybe Mike Mendoza or John Adams or others may have sought employment elsewhere and been successful, um, you know, is is a burden that I deal with more so than the Board of Selectmen. So um, certainly I don't discourage anybody from, from you know, from uh, having a discussion with the board about what their future plans might be, but I don't consider that the same as for the board, what you're talking about with the police chief or the fire chief, that's, that's all. So that's my disclaimer for the evening. Mr. All right, let's take a vote. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? I have to oppose. I oppose. Thank you again. Nobody wants to work. Turn it back to the chairman. I'm sorry, I, I have to ask Jack. Um, there hasn't been any discussion about a two year. The vote was specifically on a three year. Exactly. As long as it, no one's. We took the vote. Certainly already. not the intent to, for a motion with regard to a two year agreement. I understand that, but I just want to make sure that everyone understands what's happening right now, especially me. So there's no effort to reappoint for any period of time tonight. I would make a recommendation that seek uh, some advice from. Town Council to get it to all of us. Some members of the board have already got advice. Mm -hmm. I think all of us need to have that advice. Are we ready to move on? Aye. Okay. Otherwise, I'll recuse myself while you continue this, continue this conversation. Okay. Next item up is the appointment to the Business Development Commission, Laurie Barrett. Come on up, Laurie. Please state your name and address and into the microphone, honey, so the people at home can hear you. Barrett, 38 Miles Standish Drive. And you're here because you want to join the business development? That's correct. Okay. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, sure. I actually brought copies of my resume. I don't know if all the members it's of the attached. board have that or not. It's I attached. Yep. It's yep. attached. Okay. Great. Uh, well, I first moved to Carver back in 1998. Mm -hmm. I uh, built a house on Miles Standish Drive, and then I sold it in 2008 and uh, decided it would be better off to rent for a little while, and then I decided I really missed the town. So I wanted to uh, get back into the town and just purchased a house on Miles Standish Drive again, two <laughs> houses over from where I lived before, uh, back in March. So um, I discovered while I was renting over the past five years how much I really missed yeah, the town. A good um, yeah, there's a great does. sense of community here. And I thought, moving back into the town, I'd like to get more involved in helping the town grow and yet also maintain that sense of character that it has. Sure. We're always looking for volunteers, trust me. We can't fill half the positions that we uh, that we advertise. So, uh, do we have a motion? Motion to approve. Second. We have a motion and a second. Uh, any questions for Laurie by the board? Just thank you. I read your resume. And you have a great background. Thank you. Any other comments, recommendations? Thank you, Laurie. Thank you. All right, uh, Laurie. To, since there's no uh, further questions on this, we'll. Uh, We've got a motion, we've got a second. Uh, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? It's unanimous. Great. Welcome Thank aboard. You. Thank you. Thank you. Please take a look at some of the other committees and stuff too, because I think with your background, you could be a, uh, you know, a, a real plus to a number of others. Yeah. Thank you. If you have the time. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Next up is the appointment to the Historical Commission, Mr. Donald McKeg. Come on up, Don. 
I know almost everybody knows you, but please state your name and address into the mic for people at home. Don McCagg, 225 Tremont Street, Carver, Massachusetts, South Carver. Don, and you're here to sign up for the Historical Commission, huh? Yes. Why don't you tell us a little bit? Your interest in the historical Well, commission, I've been on Cape Cod a long time, and yep. I've, uh, I've always been interested in uh, rest restorations, and I've done several buildings myself. But mostly I just uh, am committed to uh, trying to retain uh, key buildings in the history of a town. So I'd like to think I can provide some background and knowledge and certainly some uh, genuine interest in uh, maintaining the historical uh, locations of Carver and uh, anything I can do I, I'd like to. Yeah. I, you know, you certainly did a great uh, job with that building in South Carver and we sorely missed your restaurant. Thank you. I wish you were back yeah. because uh, that was a very, very nice place. It was too. Yeah. Um, do we have a motion? Motion to approve. Second? Second. We have a motion and a second. Okay. Any of the uh, would like to ask any questions, make any comments? Or? Thank you. Is, is he old enough to be historical? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he's hysterical. He's old enough to be historical. I don't know, yeah, Dick. His hair's blonde. Yours and mine is white. And so, <laughs> Jack? On the, on the Cape, have you developed very many historic properties or been involved in them? Uh, as a matter of fact, I have six of my own, uh, as well as been on the committee for the Wiano Club and. Uh, the uh, beach club in uh, Craigville Beach, and uh, also the old town hall that used to be Mass Maritime. I was on that original committee, which I'm very proud of because that was uh, that became the town hall, as you know, and uh, it's been a terrific focal point for uh, town government ever since. Is that for the town of Bourne? <coughs> town of Boston. Oh, Boston. Mm -hmm. And of course, you've been involved with the Cranebrook yes. Tea Room down here mm -hmm. at Carver. That's all. Sarah, anything? Just thanks for stepping up, Don. Thank you. All right, we have a motion and a, uh, and a second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? It's unanimous. Thank you, thanks, Don. Thanks, Don. There's other jobs available too, Don, if you get a, uh, a desire to dive in with both feet. <clears throat> Next up is uh, Sol Solari America, possible North Carver landfill solar project and extension of Route 44 solar project. Gentlemen? Not a week, John. Not a week. We have enough of those meetings. If when you get settled in there, you could, uh, um, you know, you're probably better off setting that up over there. That way the camera can get it and we'll try and follow you and the audience can hopefully. John Scorsone, President of Solar America. Uh, corporate address uh, in Boston is 1 Boston Plaza, Suite 2600, Boston, Massachusetts. All right, John, why don't you tell us a little bit about it? Uh, first of all, let everybody out there know that uh, John um, was the individual that put together the, uh, the project that's out on Route 44 right now, the solar panels that are currently out there working and doing a great job. and providing some low-cost electricity for the town. So we're talking about finishing that project um, as it was originally designed for quite a few more panels. And we also asked them to take a look at another site that's currently not being used for anything that might be able to, uh, to assist us in reducing our energy costs. So how about it, John? Thanks, Mike. Appreciate it. As Michael said... Uh, oh, John, I'm sorry. Could you take the mic with yep, you? you yep. Yeah, sure. Thanks again. This, uh, and those of us, uh, some of you have already seen it on the board, uh, about a year ago was the plan for Route 44 solar, solar project along Route 44. The orange that you see is what we ended up, we built first, phase one. 
due to timing restraints that we had, and we won't get into it, but to meet the timing, we had to break it up into two parts. We're here today to finalize the second part, which you see here, which again, it's just a continuation of what's already there and here in pink. Uh, so it'll go an additional 280 kW um, will be on site. So we're here to ask the board to finish what we started last year. We're pretty proud of the project. Of those of you who don't know, it's the second highway project in the country. First one being in Oregon, second one being here, right here in Carver. So it should be a very proud day for the town. <coughs> We've gotten nothing but very positive feedback. Um, I was telling Jack today, we get about 25 calls a day when that first opened about how wonderful it looked and how great it was and how they wanted to see if they could do it on their house or their business or along their road. Um, so it was tremendous success. We want to build on that success and, f again, finish what we started. And, and the, the, the board and the public saw this last year. It's the same exact. Again, we're just here to finalize that project and ask the board approval to finish what we started over here. And also, as the chairman, uh, chairman O'Donnell discussed during that meeting, they asked us to look at another project, which was the landfill site. And I apologize for my appearance. I was actually walking the landfill, so I'm kind of dirty. I feel like I'm walking through the woods to, to this evening about two hours ago. But we did some preliminary work. Put that up for you. This is the North Carver landfill, by the way. North Carver landfill, right on Main Street. And what you're looking at here is essentially the top of the landfill is a flat, grassy area, elevated, perfectly situated for solar. Uh, no neighbors. Um, again, a flat meadow area where we envision. A ballasted system. When I say ballasted system, uh, no penetrations into the ground. They sit on concrete pillars on the top of the ground. So there's no digging, no penetration, no disturbance to the ground whatsoever. And the panels will sit on the flat area on the top of the hill, not be able to visible to anywhere whatsoever. So we think this is an excellent solar site, an excellent reuse of land. I can give you, I can hand out some summaries here. You know, if you want to pass this along. It's just a summary of what's possible. <coughs> but essentially what's possible on the site is about another 1.8 megawatts. So a million eight watts of solar power, if necessary, could go there or smaller. But we think without any issue whatsoever, just utilizing the top of, the, uh, of, that, of that landfill, you could easily get another 1.8 megawatts if necessary. And we think it would complement what we've already done. Obviously, I think the town has seen what we're capable of and the quality installations we are known for and what we do. And we like, again, our company's known for thinking out of the box and to reuse land that is unusable, uh, I think is a smart move on the town's part. Thank you, John. And again, <clears throat> this is a piece of unusable land for anything else. And it's not in anybody's backyard. Excuse me. <coughs> it's not in anybody's backyard, and I don't believe they can see it from the street either, right? No, John? you cannot see it from the street. So, oh, I mean, it, it doesn't negatively impact anybody. And this is the kind of solar projects that we need in town, okay? Thank you, John, for coming in and doing that and trudging the tick infested uh, no, ivy, not a problem. poison ivy uh, ground. <laughs> so. My pleasure. Um, do we have any questions for the broad? Does, does this fit into our capacity? I mean, Ma we had Mary O'Donnell in here a few months ago when we were pretty close to our capacity. Um, Jack, yeah. Jack can answer that. Yeah. yeah. I can try. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes and no. How's that? You're um, a, you're a good you politician. Know, you're under contract with Mary O'Donnell, no fossil fuel for three megawatts. Um, if you remember, before you hired Mary or <coughs> started to negotiate with Mary, we had a study done, a very brief study that they paid for to kind of analyze where you're at in the whole world of electricity. Jack, could you use the mic a little bit? Oh, better? I'm sorry. And that um, we believe you're about at 3.9 to 4.1 or 2. of what That's what you use on an annual basis. So you have three that Mary's has. The, the one on 44 is only 100 kilowatts, so it's not right. even in play, really. 
but you're also technically under contract with Intero for one megawatt. Now, I, I, I'm sorry. My understanding was with uh, Mary O'Donnell, it was up to 2.4. It's three. I believe. No. Is it 2.4? Uh, no. oh, no. Okay, that's even better. Yeah, I thought we yeah. did 2.4 and we left some extra capacity on the table. I, have, we have I about agree about with that. Right. We so didn't. we got 2.4 with Mary. We got one with Antero. Now, I will tell you, Mary's is moving along. She had two benchmarks she had to make. Um, one was by, Mar by April 1st, she had to have all her capacity sold, which she has. She sold the rest of the capacity to the Silver Lake School. And her next benchmark is June 30th, where she has to start construction in Dartmouth. Right. And I was on the phone today with, well, with Michael Frenette from No Fossil, and they're on schedule for that breaking ground. And so Dartmouth seems to be re very receptive to this, so I don't expect any problems from Dartmouth at all. I, and there's no appeals. Yeah. They've negotiated out of the appeals. So I think that's real. Um, with Entero, it's a little different, I think. And I think even the owner would say that they're, if not on life support, they're in intensive care on that project, mostly due to the interconnection application or agreements that they have to enter in with NSTAR. The cost of improving the electrical system from the solar panels to wherever right. is cost prohibitive. Uh -huh. at, and they're trying to find some alternatives, but it didn't look too good. But there's, you're still under contract at this moment. When, when does that contract expire? It's open-ended until construction, I believe. I will check, Mike. Okay. I will check and get back to the board on that. So anyways, with the 2.4 and the Antera 1? You're about 3.4. I'd say you'd be okay with 0.8 even with a Antero. I'm just doing calculations here. Without Antero, you could build the whole landfill. Yeah. So if I may? Sure. So, John, are you are you looking for some sort of power purchase agreement with the town, or would you be doing this whether or not we wanted to have one with you? Well, actually, uh, I would suggest we already have one in place. We okay. would just uh, simply extend it uh, to whatever the new capacity would be. So keep all the contract exactly the same and just put the new capacity on. That's what I would suggest. And would you also be looking for a payment in lieu of taxes agreement or no? Uh, that would be, uh, I'm sorry, on the, on the investment side? On the personal property. Yeah. Oh, maybe we should ask the director of assessing to. Well, that's actually one of the questions I wanted to ask the board um, because this opportunity, um, we didn't know exactly how the board would want to set up. If they do, for instance, we do have capacity. Let's say we do. I mean, we should know probably 30 days or so, I guess. And you're, it's necessary to build 1.5 or 1.8 megawatts. What would the lease agreement be, I guess, with the town? I, since the town already owns it, right. um, we would be open to discuss oh. whatever you want to do. I, I'm sorry. I, I wasn't talking about a lease oh, agreement. I was talking about <coughs> personal property tax on the structures themselves. Oh, the structures themselves. And that's probably a, a director of assessing question, too. Yeah. I, I know that on Route 44 they were exempt because it was on state property. Okay. Why don't we let Ellen join us, and uh, maybe she can enlighten us about that. Um, the Department of Revenue is currently discouraging payments in lieu of taxes. They would prefer to see that the uh, property is taxed. Um, so that would be uh, something that would need to be considered. And uh, we would need to be looking at some kind of um, way that we're going to be taxing it, whether it's going to be real estate or personal property. In the, the case of the property, the um, well, no, I was actually, well, yeah, Route 44, <laughs> I, I, well, it, it was exempt because the power was going directly to the town for, and it was on um, state property. If you are going to be selling anything to the grid, okay, then as long as it's going directly to the town, not, not a... Uh, Question, can you split that, sell it to the town and sell it to the grid? Okay. We would not be interested in, in doing that. Two John, you might want to use the mic. <coughs> no one ever asked me to use a microphone. I'm usually loud enough. Um, we are not interested in selling into the grid. We do behind the meter um, interconnections. We think they make the most sense. Okay. Uh, and there are two separate interconnection agree agreements, and 
we have no desire to go into the grid. So, so I guess that tax would not be an issue if it went right to the town. Is, am I hearing that correctly? If, if the electricity is being used by the town, uh, not as a PPU, a, a PPA. Um, power purchase agreements are something else altogether, and um, they may or may not exempt you from property taxes. That's something we have to discuss because this is the first actually I heard about it. So. Well, Jack's Ellen. the point man on that, so he should be able to work with Ellen on that. And Can John. we make an analysis of which would be the most beneficial to the town, either receiving taxes or receiving the $115,000 savings per year? Yeah, Ellen, do you think you could do something like that? Okay. We, I, I can work with, with um, John on that. I, I know where you're coming from, but it is there is a stipulation tax code or DOR regs that, that say that if, if for anyone, if you're producing electricity from renewable energy and you're using it yourself, you are tax exempt, but not for property tax, from personal property. Right. Okay. So I think that's okay. One. I just want to see which would be most beneficial to the town. Yeah. I mean, if we're, if we're giving up $300,000 a year in personal property taxes for a savings of 115000 well, I just, I'll remind the board that you're not getting any taxes right now. I, I realize that. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, Mr. Chairman, with your permission, I also asked Wayne Perry from Norfolk Ram. He, he monitors the landfill. Sure. I've walked the site with him twice, plus with the Board of Health, just in case you had any issues or questions about the status of the landfill itself, which it was way before me. Right. Um, but I know that what John, I believe, is asking the board is a actual vote on expanding the Route 44 only, For tonight. and then maybe the go ahead. And I think I'm hearing it to keep yeah. working on the landfill, something like that. Okay, That's Dick, uh, Helen, you have any questions uh, for John or Jack? Uh, just uh, a comment. I encourage I encourage that Route 44 expansion. I know when we went for that permission from the state, we worked hard to get that. So uh, I'm glad that it allows us to expand. So I'm all for it. Anybody else? Jack? Um, are you essentially going to be doubling the um, number of panels out there? Yeah, it's actually uh, more than I apologize. We're going to go from 100 kW to 280, so a little more than double. Again, we're going to answer your question. We're going to fill out the e easement like we planned last, I guess it was last April when I was in here. This was going to be phase one. And phase two is just f simply filling out the easement that the state allowed it for the for solar. So do you have an idea of what the savings will be to the water district? I, I did. I think I provided that information um, early on. We're saving about $600 a month now. So yeah. if you make that a little less than two thirds, so maybe fifteen, sixteen hundred. Oh, he's doing it now, so something like that. What percentage of the electrical costs are being taken care of by solar now? At the treatment, well, I'll let John. It, it was. It's a. It's a moving target. So the way we understand it, the price of of uh, the, the town was purchasing a little over fifteen cents a kilowatt hour. The contract called for ten, which is a saving of five cents a kilowatt hour. So with the extent, with the expansion, you're saving sixteen thousand eight hundred dollars a year times twenty years, uh, three hundred thirty-six thousand. How much is it cost? And that's without the increase of, of increase in um, the price of electricity, which we all know goes up. So how much are they spending right now a year? Uh, I don't have that information on, off the top of my head. But I do know phase one was essentially covering about, I believe it was sixty-five percent. So phase two would finish that off and then have access for the town. Be a hundred percent plus. Correct. At the current rate, now they may increase their their requirement. I don't know if they have any expansions. So are you or looking for a motion to extend the? Right. I'll make, I'll make a motion to extend. The, uh, finish the expansion. Expansion on the Route 44 project. Correct. Yes. I'll, I'll second that. We got a motion and a second. Any further comments, questions, just, just recommendations, questions. concerns? We don't pay anything to have it constructed. You take care of all that. Not a dollar. 
-hmm. The only other thing, John, is uh, you're going to expand the security on that too, right? That is correct. And we've so, learned our lesson, obviously. <laughs> we learned our lesson on that, right? Uh, you guys did a great job on that, and I want to thank you and your team, and I want to thank, thank you for being accommodating about the North Cava landfill, and hopefully we can get something worked out with that, and you know, and, and it'll be beneficial to the town again. So we value the partnership, and we thank the <clears throat> board and the town. It's been a wonderful partnership, and we'd love to expand it. So thank you for the opportunity. All right, we have a motion and a second. Uh, any further comments, questions, concerns? Hearing none. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed. It's unanimous. Thank you, John. Thank Thanks, you. Jack. Thank you. Thank your team, too, for coming in tonight. Appreciate it. I, I, just a comment on that, Mr. Chairman. I, I can't believe how much this guy got done. In yeah. a short period of time last year. Yeah. Uh, a project that supposedly couldn't be done, he, right. he ended up doing. So I, Well, you know, you can see when it's acceptable to everybody, it doesn't have as many roadblocks or obstacles in its path. Right. You know what I mean? So I, I just want to say it couldn't be done without the help of everybody here and my crew and our team. Uh, it ended up being a great project. So thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, John. All right. Next up is uh, Mr. Dick Sullivan of Powers and Sullivan. Review of annual audit recommendations. Thanks for coming in, Dick. If you could just uh, state your name and everything into the microphone. My name is Richard Sullivan partner in the firm of Powers and Sullivan, also the engagement partner uh, for the fiscal uh, 2012 audit. Um, the way I usually go about this is just kind of walk you through basically the three products that we put out as part of the audit. One is the financial statements, and I won't get too deep, but just to give you an idea of what we do, give you also an idea of what, the, what it is that we audit and how we kind of verify uh, some of the certain things so that you know that um, things have been looked at. The second piece of it, which kind of goes quick, is to talk a little bit about the federal report, which is called the A133 audit, and then I finish up with the management letter. Um, to get you an idea of how we go about our audit, it's all about what they call risk base, and it's all based on what you're understanding of the systems, uh, the controls in place, the numbers that we're looking at, whether it be from and where the sources of revenues are, and we go through all these processes in determining how we're going to do our audit. The audit takes approximately three to three and a half weeks in the field. Um, this year was a little different, but um, I mean, sorry, 2012 was a little different, but this year what we'll do is we'll come a little bit in the June and we'll, we'll knock off a lot of the stuff that's not date sensitive, meaning mm -hmm. it's not uh, specific to June 30th. And then we'll come back in after that and probably in the November time frame, could be earlier, uh, it was October, actually it was September last year and we'll walk down the balance sheet and we'll audit cash, receivables, payables, make sure the cutoff is all okay. We'll clean up anything we couldn't get done as part of our preliminary work. After we go through all that, there's really, when you look at the report, the only thing that we own in, on these reports, um, how we help compile the numbers, but the only thing that we own is the actual opinion itself. Um, and we're opining essentially that the numbers for, for the balance sheet are correctly stated and properly classified that the revenue and expenditures do you see, probably mostly just from your standpoint is the budget to actual statement because that's how you manage the, the town, are in fact correct that the budgetary numbers, uh, the budget itself, the appropriations itself, and the revenues that have been uh, reported are accurate. And we do this, we verify this by actually doing what we call cycle transactions, um, testing, excuse me, of certain transactions. We look at the revenue cycle, we look at the disbursement cycle, we look at the payroll cycle, and we also do what's called journal entry testing and the reason we do that is in sometimes when a system requires, some systems, uh, most systems have standard journal entries that are required. But a journal, a journal entry can infer that something's being corrected. So we look for systematic type issues that might lead us to believe that maybe the design is not correct and constantly has to be fixed. And in essence, all that tra transaction testing that we did came out satisfactory from an audit standpoint. Um, the major areas that we look at, if you're going to look at your balance sheet, when you talk about your assets of the town, you had $47.8 million in assets that include structures like this building. Um, your liabilities were $25.1 million. The big parts of that, what we consider the risk areas, are cash and investments, which at the end of 2012 was $9.4 million. Receivables were almost five. We do also some payroll, I'm sorry, some accrued payroll in um, payable testing particularly for the cutoff to make sure that the year end went right, that things weren't kited and put into the next year. Those total just under $2 million. 
you got a big OPEB liability in your books of about 12.5. Um, and then you have some capital leases and, of course, your long-term debt. Now, what we do with those balance sheet items, we've got, we substantive test them, which means we make sure that the numbers that are appearing in there are fairly presented, and they actually, we try to tie them to the penny <coughs> if possible. When you look at the other side of it and we say, okay, what happened based on expectations and what, what happened when we look at the change in fund balance, we also do some analytic procedures. And what those uh, showed us is that, in essence, the town, which over the last three years has done fairly well, and we go looking back three years analytically, you've had actually a profit, a small profit each and every year, which is what you want. If you read the DOL website, they say you should be regenerating free cash if possible. At the end of 2012, you had an $861,000 profit. It may sound like a lot of money, but realistically, it means that you're doing better than break even. And primarily, the reason is because you ex collected a little more than you expected to collect and you didn't spend everything. Now, that little more was about 2% more than you expected, and spending was about 1% less than you expected. So you get the gravity of the numbers where we're really the budgetary process went fairly well, and almost a million dollar surplus sounds good, but on a, on a, um, a revenue stream of, uh, or appropriation of about $39 million, it's really just about breaking even and you're on the right side of the, <coughs> right side of the ledger at the end of the day. Um, you really didn't have a whole lot of long-term debt er, uh, activity, but the town likes to get itself involved with what we call capital leases. You lease, some, you lease some equipment. The big ones that we saw this year was there an ambulance, there was a new backhoe, a bush breaker, which I didn't know it was until I saw the picture, and um, some police vehicles. Um, so you spent about $818,000 in purchasing fixed assets using capital leases as your leasing vehicle versus going out on the street and issuing debt. In essence, there's 54 pages that the financial statements are made up with. I'm more than willing to delve into anything in there, um, but I like this stuff and I get the, the feeling that most people here would probably lose a little bit, not lose much sleep looking at this thing, but you had a clean opinion. And what that means is an unqualified opinion. It's the best opinion that the town can get as it relates from our eyes and us opining on what those financial statements purport to show, primarily to investors and, prefer and also citizens who might be interested in what's going on. Yeah. The second report we issue is called the F Report on Federal Awards. And what that is is the town receives a little under $2 million worth of federal grants. And some of those grants have to be tested in accordance with what they call the A133 audit. All of it's related to the school and primarily it's the special education uh, grants that we audit. We go over there and we do some special testing that's actually regulated and, and put into what we have to do as auditors by the feds to say this is how you go about auditing SPED. We did that and what we came out with there was no question cost. There were no issues that we found in any of the grant reporting or the grant accounting. We had one uh, comment that said there's a certification of time as it relates to spe special education teachers as to uh, allocating their time. It doesn't, re it's easily fixed and has been fixed after we've talked with Patrick over there. Um, and again, embedded in this report, which is about nine pages, are three separate opinions. One on internal control over financial reporting, another one on internal control over administration of grants, and another one on the actual listing of the federal grants themselves. All of those were clean opinions are what we call unqualified. Again, the best you can really get from a federal award standpoint. The last document is a product basically that we own all of. I mentioned to you that the opinions of those two reports really is the only thing we own, the numbers are yours. Mm -hmm. We own the management letter. Now, I think it's important to always talk about, or I'd like to mention that the management letter is critical in nature. This is not something that we go, it, it doesn't put pat anybody on the back when you look at the management letter. It, it basically points out things that we think are worthy to put in writing, to note for the board so that you can understand what's going on and make recommendations for improvement. When I look at the management letter, I try to classify it. When I look at this management letter, I classify it into seven areas. One is what I would call the reconciliations of key asset accounts. That's receivables, cash, et cetera. The other one was timely reporting of financial activity, being able to have the general ledger be, um, have accurate and timely information so that's, let's say, it's one month lag between when the actual event happening and it being recorded. We also recommended as a result of some of the, uh, the new Sobrio system was putting in to take a look at your, um, your passwords and the ability to access certain systems because you don't want to ever have somebody who is responsible for one end to be able to modify the other end of it. Um, 
we want made a recommendation in there to make sure that you remain what we call compliant with GASB 45. That means you have to have that OPEB actuarial done every two years. If not, what I mentioned as being a clean opinion would have to be a qualifier and adverse, which is detrimental to the town. Um, there's another one in where we talk about just information to let you know the Governmental Accounting Standards Board, which is called GASB, is coming out with a whole bunch of stuff that's basically going to flip over and change pretty much everything that's in those reports right now. By fiscal 15, it'll be changing it all over, and we're actually dealing with that as a firm right now because it's becoming a little bit of a hot button with Moody's and its S&P. Um, DOR also came up with something in the uh, beginning of 2012 that they hadn't allowed before, which uh, said that you could actually set aside for potential um, payments when uh, employees are terminated, called compensated absences, i.e. unpaid um, vacation, or if there was any sick pay buyback. They never allowed you to set the, establish these reserves. They did. You have about a $800,000 liability on your books related to that. The thought was it might be worthwhile to just kind of consider, again, like everything else, where I'm an accountant, put away reserves to cover future costs. And the final thing is, and this is probably in every management letter, not just of Powers and Sullivan, but quite a few, where it talks about there, there needs to be some sort of what we call assessment of risk and documented assessment of risk. Looking around at the various areas, particularly with um, of, let's say, critical assets that we call have feet, that could be video equipment, electrical equipment type of things like that, or certainly any collection points where there might be cash, to understand, this board understand what's happening there, what are the internal controls in place, and assessing whether or not those internal controls are sufficient for you. It's not designed to fix anything, because it's not necessarily saying there's anything broke. But back when WorldCom was happening and some of the things that were going on, and the board of directors were saying, we didn't know that was happening in our, our company, um, the private sector, let's call it the SEC world, turned and said, no, you have to be responsible. And that's gravitated to the governmental sector. With you as the governing board, if something happened, you wouldn't want to be in a position to say, I didn't know that was happening in my town. And that's what those, this, I don't even know how many pages, but that's a, mm -hmm. in essence what I'm presenting for the comments and improvements in some management uh, issues, improvements in the, uh, in the reconciliation issues um, that I wanted to share with you. Um, the good thing is, is that there were no, in my estimation, at this point in time, any, any deficiencies, significant deficiencies or material weaknesses. I think there's some things that in our report should be prioritized in terms of being addressed. Um, but there's, there was nothing at, fisc at the end of fiscal 12 that warranted to be any of these matters to be brought to the next level. That's the summation of a few hundred hours worth of work. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for condensing that for us, Dick, and helping us to understand uh, what the purpose is um, of, the, of the audit and uh, telling us what we need to concentrate on and focus on. Um, do we have any questions? Jack? Uh, just some comments on the, the fraud risk assessment. Um, you mentioned in here that you know, quite possibly you might have a management level individual who can conduct these assessments. Uh, you know, I think in most any towns, especially small towns like Kava, you really wouldn't have someone like that. It's almost like we're relying on your expertise or maybe your firm developing some courses that different members of our financial management team could attend. We do that. We've actually we put on what we call fraud seminars, and yeah. it's not necessarily meant to be a, um, a uh, check it off the box of these are all the things you have to look at, but it's more understanding what fraud is, how to identify it, and when you identify it, what to do about it. Um, and it's, it's, actually a, it's actually a fun little program. So we, we enjoy doing it. We've done for a, a number of communities and sometimes even, um, like for instance, if the town wanted something like that, maybe it'd be worthwhile to bring in because we have area clients in the area or someone who, aren't, who we want them to be. <laughs> like, like a little but regionalization sure. type of thing. We've done that The other before. thing too is people have to realize that this fraud assessment isn't just mm. for government. It's worldwide to private industry and everything else it's a big big concern yeah they i'm forgetting the acronym right now um but there's a special group, special group out there that when you hear about that sarbanes oxley going on mm -hmm. that's what this is pretty much all about and didn't sarbanes oxley come out of what was it enron or enron like worldcom which happened years ago um the one that w was it arthur Anderson imploded i think because of worldcom mm -hmm. and that's what that's what this is all about on, what's happening with the public companies, they're, they're spending more on the Sarbanes-Oxley 
Oxley compliance than they are on the audits themselves. And one other thing is the future of uh, county standard boards uh, for pensions and OPED, that's another big area. Yeah. I notice you have a lot of Gasbys on here, and even though I am a CPA, I don't follow them. So no. there again, you might need some more There'll groups be some of education. towns getting together on that. Your balance sheet is going to look a little different this year because they introduced something that I'm, I can't bore you with right now because it's called, it's called deferred inflows and deferred outflows. So we'll just leave it at that. But in 2014 and 15, there's going to be some serious changes because what's going to happen in, in those years is you pay into your retirement system based on the annual required contribution or the ARC that you're supposed to put in. Well, you have a proportionate share, and I believe it's around 2.4% of the total unfunded liability of that. That does not appear anywhere on your financial statements. In fiscal 2015, they're going to pull that liability onto the books so that you, they're going to show your portion of the assets that are in the contributory retirement system, your portion of the liability. And we know that the li unfunded liability is very significant, even at a 2.4%. That's now going to be in part of your financial statements. Right now, it's just part of the footnotes and what they call required supplementary information. And, and those payments are going to go up higher and higher every year because there's a schedule in place. On OPEB, there's no schedule in place. Well, and that's, that's the next step because the one I'm talking about in 15 for pensions, that Gatsby's already said it, they're going to come right behind it with the one for the OPEB. So right now we have an ARC that has been contributed of about $12.4 million. Your total unfunded liability is $46 million. That will be on the balance sheet. That's also. for the health insurance, not for the pension. Right. Is that going to impact us on our bond rating and stuff, Dick? I don't think so because, well, this is my crystal ball. I don't think so because everybody else is going to be in the same boat. And except for a few communities out there, nobody's really looking at OPEB. As, as, let's say as they're starting to get serious about it, but nobody's really funding OPEB except for some communities who I would consider to be fairly affluent and having some surpluses. And the pension thing is going to hit everybody no matter what. And I don't think the pension thing bothers S&P and Moody's because Massachusetts mandates that you have a, a, a solid schedule to meet your full funding requirement, whether it be the original 20 years or whether you've pushed it out to 2039. Well, eventually we're going to be forced to start to fund that. So The OPEB or the OPEB? Both, well, already the pension we're You're doing that doing, now. Yeah. yeah. But the OPEB we're going to be forced to... And so that little profit that you said we have might be disappearing. That's, and that's what a lot of folks are doing that with one-time money, just so you know. Mm -hmm. If they have an event that occurs where some one-time money comes in, they're not putting it structurally into that into the budget so that to fund, you know, the, what's right, the current. Right, general fund, They're yeah. saying let's set it aside and put it into OPEB and start something like that. And in some cases it's probably symbolic when you look at the numbers, but the symbolism is important to get people to pay attention. Yeah, that's what I had said before. And we actually have set up an account and we were thinking of putting the Medicaid Part D money in it, but that hasn't happened yet. <laughs> well, these are all things we can certainly discuss down the road. Uh, you said you're coming back in in June. You're going to start your audit. We've, we've got a team actually coming out. Um, uh, we're going to be dealing with the town accountant's office a little bit. Um, and I believe I have town meetings next week, right, annual town meetings. So mm -hmm. on Tuesday, we'll be out at the school also doing the uh, single audit piece. We'll work on the budget. We'll work on the debt. And then there's some stuff that we do, what I call behind the scenes of prepping ourselves and making sure our work papers meet peer review quality standards. This will be on the 2013 numbers? Yes. Yeah. It's all part okay. of 2013. We're done. 2012 is over. Okay. I see how one has some just questions. A, just a quick, easy question. Um, in terms of the Gatsby adding those additional provisions coming with the 67 and 68 for the pensions, you mentioned in the report that the Gatsby is encouraging earlier application of these standards. What is it? Is there a benefit for us to? Okay, they're just. Uh, be honest with you, the GASB usually comes out with a lot of illustrative literature. They actually they'll be coming out with implementation guides. They haven't got there yet. Okay. So we're supposed to be the experts to assist you folks in doing it, and they're supposed to be experts <laughs> that are telling us what's supposed to happen. It hasn't it, it hasn't trickled down off the mountain yet, so okay. we don't know. So just keep it as is. Sorry, I'm doing. Uh, thank you. I believe the last time the board met. The, some of the members had a question about the uh, whether or not this document, the 2012 audit report, was in fact a public document when you sent it to us. I was just wondering if you could straighten that up. Is that a question? I mean, yes. is there a question in the board? I don't think the question was so much was it a public document as the fact that it hadn't been vetted by the board before it was, was released to the general. Before it was released to the general public. 
Well, that's my question yeah. right now. Is it was it a which, public which document? Which was completely when you unprofessional. So, the, the under Massachusetts law, I'm pretty sure every document that gets officially accepted by a community then becomes part of public documentation. That's my that, understanding. That's my point. I don't think we accepted anything. So, do you, Mr. Chair? So since that note has come up, I, I was kind of curious. I wasn't going to bring it up, but because the question was asked, you mentioned in the management letter on the last page, um, we recommend that management begin to study and evaluate these changes for reporting and disclosure purposes. You may want to consider how and when this information should be communicated to your constituents and other financial statement users. Why? Yeah, translate. <laughs> like, oh, why was that put in there? Well, what it, what it is is, um, are we talking about? Uh, oh, I'm in the management letter. Yep, I'm just gonna. Last page. This is the uh, the with all the Gasbys that are coming out. You got it. Well, what what's going to happen is, is if somebody, like I said, and I'm, I don't know who might be looking at these, but I know that there's people who do pay attention to this stuff, and being aware of what's going to be significant changes in the reporting model. I mean, I'm not sure if a lot of this board was here when GASB 34 came out in 2002 and 3 and 4, no. where all of a sudden um, cities and towns now had to report fixed assets. They had to report uh, 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 long-term debt on their balance sheets. There's a, there was a whole change there, and that was like um, almost like an early incentive for retirement for some town accountants. Um, this one here is going to be very similar. Um, it's going to change the way your balance sheet looks right now, where right now your statement of net assets has a positive um, amount of probably, let me just find the number. Like On the a governmental side, has a positive 19 million and about $3.4 million for the uh, enterprise funds. Mm -hmm. That's going to go away because there's going to be a $42 million liability for OPEB in one of those columns, and there's going to be whatever the 2.4 percent of the unfunded liability of the pension plan in there then. And so that what's going to happen is, I, I use the expression, it's going to blow a hole in your balance sheet. Right. And educating people as to what that means and understanding okay. it yourselves okay. is more like what that comment's all about. Okay. And yeah, we're not going to have the equity anymore. No. Nope. Like negative equity. It, there's going to be, it's going to be compartmentalized so somebody can understand that we know this is an accounting thing. The liability is real. We all know that OPEB's real because mm -hmm. the plans are in place. We right. all know the unfunded liability is real because the payments are in place. But they're going to now appear more, I don't want to use blatantly, but blatantly. more concisely and, and not hidden in the back of the footnotes Put anymore. They're going to be on the front of the financial statements. But, but, but if it impacts our bond reading, every town and every state is well, going to be impacted sound like the it same will way. We're all reason. going down together. It, if they look at bond peer groups. Those. They, they right. tend to look at how is this community doing with a peer community. And if uh, you guys are doing better, you have a better chance of having a better bond rating. Yeah. If you guys are doing the same, everybody's in the same boat. And, and of course, inversely, it could be detrimental if somebody else is doing something more towards dealing with these issues. Okay. Through you, Mr. Chair. You triggered another question. Hmm? Oh, I'm talking to myself. Oh, how is the conversation going? <laughs> 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 Motion and a second. Yeah, yeah there you go. <laughs> It just triggered a question. When you were talking about the net assets being at $19 million, I had um, um, put a, a little note there. You had mentioned somewhere in the management, in, in the, these three um, reports, that if net assets, um, it can be a, um, a trigger if they're continuing to go down, that that may be mm -hmm. a pro, you know, a, a, um, uh, a, a risk or a sign, a red flag that something may be going wrong. Mm -hmm. And I noticed, like in reading this report between 11 and 12, that it went down 3400 And that's uh, all the OPEB, the recognition of additional So that's liability. already, right. okay. But if I was going to, if I just, you know, if you're going to pay, I would say the way, because of the way you run the town and the way I would anticipate that you should advise, I'd look at your real the fund balance, and in there is also another uh, yeah. uh, financial statement it's called the balance sheet yeah. and a revenue expenditure statement. You've had a constant trend of having a small surplus every year. Right now, your overall fund balance is about 10% of your appropriations of three million and change. All right, that's pretty good. Okay. I mean, when you're at see the we call it the, I call it the Mendoza line. You don't want to be low low five percent, <laughs> and when you start getting up, that means you're going to have the ability to you know to you know manage those ups and downs. Okay. Um, and when I saw the trend, when I was doing the trend analysis, 
I saw that when you include the stabilization fund in there, because we have total fund balance and unreserved fund balance, you've, average, you've gone from 6.8% to 9.7%. Oh, that's, that's a positive that's trend. Good. That's why mm -hmm. I'm, I'm thinking that when I, if I'm just a numbers guy and, and a man who, uh, an accountant who likes to see reserves, I think that's well done. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. Now, the Mendoza line is a baseball term. I was oh, sorry. It <laughs> has nothing to do with our former building commissioner, just, just so. Sorry. Isn't that somewhere around Washington, D.C., or Virginia? Uh, I think he was on the Mets. Wasn't it a Mets? Uh, Mets. It's like two-something. And I still haven't gotten over 86, so yeah, the hell right. with the Mets. So, but it was a Mendoza. It was a baseball term. So. Any further questions by the board? Um, through you, Mr. Just, this is more for the board. Um, should we be talking about getting together to talk about um, working with Meg in terms of these recommendations and which ones that we should start working on, especially the fraud risk assessment area? We would probably have to take some accounting courses to mm. understand this. Well, we could certainly yeah. sit down and do a roundtable discussion on it. Uh, let's get through town meeting yeah. first, though, and then we yeah. can Well, the, that's why I'm wondering that. if this is a good time to yeah. do something like that or wait till your next visit. Or just to have Meg come in and offer some um, education as to which recommendations you think would. We can we can do that. Yeah. yeah. Any other questions for Mr. Sullivan? He's got a long trip back, right? It's okay. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you very much. Thanks for Thank coming you, down, Dick. We appreciate it. All right. Next up is Mr. Robert Bentley, RE CPA Tax Reduction and Discussion and Review. A proposed project and paid bills for CPA project at Sons of Veterans Hall. That's a sentence and a half. All right, thanks, Bob, for being yes. here. Please state your name and address and purpose in life for the year. Uh, I'm Bob Bentley. I'm uh, chair of the C uh, Community Preservation Committee and um, at 61 Road. We uh, we know you were here last time and prepared to answer what was on the agenda, and we apologize for asking for additional information. Thank you for accommodating and coming back and. And working with us on this okay glad to be here it was a long night <laughs> <laughs> yes it was so okay where did we leave off on this does anybody remember well I I wanted to know what was in the account right now because the town meeting moves forward and approves the reduction from the three percent to the one percent I know it has to go out to a vote at the next annual town meeting you know we don't want to be making that decision but got enough money in the uh, account to cover the remaining payments that are due on the um, CPA bond with the water district. So that's what I want to know is how do we stand financially? Well, there's two, two different perspectives from, from that uh, in terms of that. One is how much money is, is uh, presently in the account. And uh, I have to say that our town accountant is brand new and she's been, been working really hard but she hasn't been, been able to provide me with the information that I needed so I've used some older older data data uh, to try to come up with what I expect are the, are the amounts of money that are presently in the account uh, based on what I know has been expended on various projects what still has to be expended on approved articles that sort of thing and I expect that we have at this point approximately three hundred fifty six thousand dollars in in the community preservation account uh, that's again assuming that uh, uh, now that that's that's assuming that we're 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 approving both of the articles coming at up at actually all of the articles coming up at town meeting, which would be the affordable housing article for one hundred fifty thousand dollars, the recreation article for one hundred twenty thousand dollars, and the coal property bond payment, which would be one hundred ten thousand dollars or thereabouts. Um, so that's that's where where I'm coming from, and I. I just I'm, I'm trying to make sure that I'm giving you as close an estimate as I as I have. So we have enough in there to cover the articles that are before town meeting. Correct. The the way the committee has always worked is uh, conservatively. We've we have never ever uh, we've actually tried to make sure we're, we're only using money that's in the bank sure. as opposed to money that that we're hoping is going to come to right, us. Right. Uh, you know, it it just to me and I think to the committee has been that we're we're much in a much smarter mode uh, for the, c the committee as well as for the town yeah. to make sure that we're not overextending <clears throat> ourselves at any one point. 
Are um, there separate accounts for, for the different facets of the community preservation, i.e. His, historical preservation, affordable housing, and... Chapter 44B requires that there be 10% of the uh, whatever comes in uh, of whatever comes in right put into affordable housing 10% to be putting in, into oceans um, open space right and 10% uh, to be put into um, historical preservation. thank you <laughs> historical preservation so these are all segregated they're in separate accounts correct okay and so when we draw monies for these articles we draw them from those different accounts correct and okay. and every year we make sure that we're we're using the monies out of out of those specific earmarks to to take care of that okay. uh, we and we have a separate article on the warrant to make sure that that's those are funded you know if for instance we we approve the affordable housing act uh, affordable housing article this year then we don't have to worry about putting in the 10 percent because we've already taken care of the 10 percent so it it's it, it you know we, we make sure it's all working correctly uh, the town accountant has kept a very good record in terms of what monies are available in e each various account, uh, and so we're we're very much cognizant of that. Now, if we go from three percent to one percent, our uh, actually I have a uh, handout for the board, and I think I handed it out before, but I'm not sure. Uh, but basically, if we go from three percent, <coughs> the uh, thank you, thank you. The total revenue in this is on 2012 dollars. The total revenue at three percent was approximately 510,276 dollars for 2012. At one percent, it'll drop to 144,467. So it's not actually a, a uh, only a three percent drop. It's a much more significant drop than that. The state match uh, would drop from from uh, at three percent, 49 percent to 27% at 1%. So there's a 22% difference. So there's a, a pretty significant difference. Now, if we were to expend all of the money that's presently available in, in the, uh, the CPA funds and had only the incoming monies at 1%, we would be able to, to uh, pay the uh, coal property debt and only have a little bit left over. So we would have just enough to do that, but we would have enough to do that. Um, and that's you know that that is a concern of of ours, uh, particularly given given the fact that the Community Preservation Act mm -hmm. was changed very significantly back back last July to allow for recreation projects to be done uh, where it wasn't allowed to be done in the past. Uh, it's now the, the 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 rules changed way very 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 significantly to allow projects that were you know projects that that were you know for instance uh the the track at the carver high school that could be paid for out of community preservation funds uh if we were to were to be lucky enough to build a new school we could conceivably use those use the monies in the community preservation act funds to pay for recreational facilities on the new school property or re re renovated school property so i think there's some real benefit in terms of keeping it at three percent uh and uh I'm here to say that it's it's a great thing, and we've we've done a lot of good things. But uh, I also understand that uh, the town and the town meeting has to have a chance to vote. Everybody's competing for scarce dollars. I totally yes, understand. That. That's the and problem, Mr. Chairman. Yes. My concern was that having you come back would be that we didn't overexpend it, and by dropping back to the one percent, we didn't have enough money to pay for the coal property. But according to your figures and projections. If the town voted and followed through with the dropping it to the one percent, would still have the money at least to maintain it. And what's it like? Four years left in that? I believe there's about four years left. Yeah. So after four years, and I, and I believe it's every five years you can vote to change the percentage on the CPA. So if we changed it beginning next year, it would run for five years, and then you could come back and change it back to the three percent if th the voters wanted to do that. I'm not sure that there's a, a limitation after the, I think it was after the first five years and then there's I don't believe there's any yeah, that's what I thought limitation too. after that. I didn't think it was every five year oh, increment. Okay. Yeah. Of course we know what the results were at the last election as far as the voice of the people that showed up to vote anyways. So. <clears throat> I agree and, and I you know the, the, the key here is that uh, the vote that has to happen at town meeting would be to uh, reduce from from three percent to one percent and then there then it has to go on to the next 
uh, annual town meeting That's ballot right. so that the in the uh, effect in the end would be that there would there'd be no change in tax bills until FY15. That's correct. Mm -hmm. uh, if it passed. Last Thursday, uh, the Registry of Deeds had a program. Our historical commission uh, has a display down there, and it's very interesting, so folks should go down. But what happened was John Buckley, the uh, Register of Deeds, said he's talking about Carver is selling houses better than they have for some time. And the monies that go to the state to be given to the towns under that uh, CPA come from that money. And he said, and he pointed out, he said, if your town is supplying a lot of that money and you're giving it to other towns. So uh, that was his comment. It was interesting. Good. Sure. Yes, thank you. Um, also, John Buckley pointed out to us that at the Registry of Deeds, they have uh, very old documents. I think they had one going back to, was it the 1600s? In just a plain, ordinary envelope. And so we asked him about that because plain, ordinary envelopes um, are not typically acid-free paper. And um, he pointed out they don't have the funds to convert all their um, envelopes and booklets into this acid-free paper to preserve these old, old documents. And I just wanted to remind people that that was one of the projects we did here in the town clerk's office with Community Preservation Act monies. We, we took all our very old documents that would have been eaten up by the acid and, and converted them. Um, I was going to say something else, but I forgot. So I'll think of it. Anybody else concerning the CPA? Oh. Okay. Go ahead. Um, Bob, you mentioned the new uh, changes that came into place, and I just kind of wanted to, you correct me if I'm wrong, but I kind of wanted to elaborate a little on it. So for example, um, it used to be that once we expended the funds for each of the three categories, uh, housing, uh, historical, and, and open space projects, or put that 10% into the three separate funds, then we could spend money on recreational projects, but they couldn't be renovation of existing recreational facilities, facilities yeah. for example. So, but now the law has changed. So for example, if we wanted to upgrade our playground in the middle of town or put new surfacing on it, which I know it badly needs, we could now do that under the, uh, the new changes. Whereas before we had to do it only on land that had been purchased by community preservation funds. Correct. So that, that's a huge, uh, huge change. And we've been, we've been approached in the past on the Far Street uh, ball field, yeah. uh, which, you know, honestly, I remember driving past it way too many times looking at it and saying, why would I ever let any kids try to play on that field? They'll end up with uh, major raspberries all over their whole body. Yes, they do um, play there. And so I, you know. I coached on that field, Bob. Pardon me? I said I coached on that field. Boy, it must have. did get raspberries. It must have been terrible. <laughs> but it, it's a situation now where we couldn't use the monies before for that. Now we can. Right. Mr. Chairman. Yes. And I'm surprised you didn't know about this, Bob, but uh, there was another change in the law that said instead of taking the money collected from uh, and taxing the people, we could take the money out of the town coffers and bring it up to the 3% and we'll still get similar matches to what you have up on here. But you'd have to dedicate certain revenues if you put it in the article. And that, that was part of the change that came about, and you didn't bring any of that up. And I mean, we could put ourselves on the same basis but instead of taking 200, approximately $200,000 a year and additional taxpayers out of the taxpayers' pockets, we could take it out of the town coffers. And to say that we don't have the money, I mean, we just heard the auditor say that we had a profit of about $800,000. So taking a couple hundred thousand of that and putting it into the CPA under a dedicated type of uh, revenue stream, we'd get the same results, but instead of the taxpayers paying it, the town would be paying it. So we should think about something like the, that. Well, the taxpayers, the taxpayers are ultimately payers. paying for everything anyway. Well, so, this, I mean. this, is, this is a tax on a tax, yeah. which is... Right. Yeah. But I'm not sure that the uh, same exemptions would, would still stay stand with that. Well, you wouldn't have any exemptions on it because you wouldn't have any taxpayers. And we have exemptions it. presently on the 3%. Well, we you have the exemption for the first $100,000 in value currently. Well, 
So I'm sure I, I'm if, just the trying to, if the I'm exemptions just trying to went away, it the makes it less, less palatable. The result some money, and let's take it out of our town coffers because we have the money built up there. And, and we have the low income exemption, don't forget. Correct. I, I would just caution that I'm not, I'm not sure everyone would understand that uh, when we talk about um, the town having the money, I think what you're talking about ultimately is what ends up as free cash. And you won't know that that does fluctuate from year to year. Well, it doesn't right? necessarily have to be from free cash. It could be from but that will be sale of town-owned property. Right, but either way. Tax to, possessions. Right, which is generally one-time revenue that comes in. So to try mm -hmm. and dedicate resources long-term with one-time revenue is, I would just think you want to think long and hard before you decide well, just, that's a way to go the forward. The town's going through the whole town's going through some tough times. So. Well, I think Jack was just pointing out an option, but I mean, it's, it's, it's obvious to all of us we're having a difficult time, enough time, trying to fund the building stabilization fund so we can move forward on some of those projects. So, but I, I understand what you're saying, Jack. Yeah, I do. Um, any other questions, for Mr. Bentley, on the CPA issues? Thank you. Okay. Uh, what, the other half of this question, uh, Jack, was that you also? Yes. Um, I noted in looking at the bills that uh, and basically what happens is any department that submits a bill to the town accountant for payment um, makes a photocopy of it and uh, gives it to the town accountant for the town accountant to include with the check and mail out to people. Um, I noticed from the CPC fund that they were uh, doing work for the Sons of Veterans Hall and, I'm, and I was one of the proponents for doing that work there. That it would be, I believe the exemption that we found for it was that it would be historic in nature. But what I did note was all the different contractors that were being paid, instead of paying the contractor directly, we were paying the Sons of Veterans Hall. And I just felt that that was inappropriate, that it, the contractor should be paid instead of the uh, organization. Well, this, this actually goes back quite a ways now because uh, we actually have been doing this since I've been chair, which is too many years now. Uh, when we first started doing uh, projects with, with non-profits or not-for-profits, i.e. non-public pro projects, I had a discussion with John Q. Adams uh, at, at the time, and he felt it was much more appropriate to pay the, the so-called private entities uh, directly so that they could then pay the vendors, partly because they're not, they're not required to go through the procurement rules the same way as public project is and so John felt and I didn't disagree with him that it was much more appropriate to, to take any monies that were put on public projects for instance uh, the Lake and M Green Buckman Park uh, Marcus Atwood all of those could be paid directly to the vendors uh, but in the, in the cases of Union Church United Parish Habitat for Humanity Sons of Veterans they were private projects, and they were. And what we des decided was that it was much more appropriate to pay the uh, the entity and have the entity then distribute to the to the vendor. That did two things. It it took care of worrying about uh, procurement law uh, rules, and B, it also helped the the private entity make sure that they were keeping on on top of what uh, payments were being made and, and that they were they knew where, where the payments were, were going when. Uh, John Q agreed with me. I have talked with Meg about it. She seems to have agreed with me in terms of uh, you know what, what it was that we put in place. Uh, I honestly think it's, it's a very clean, very uh, antiseptic way of doing it. I think it's the best way for the town. I, I think it's, it doesn't create any problems for us. And uh, like I say, it's been done since my inception, which is too many years ago. Well, my, my feeling in this whole thing was if we're paying uh, payments directly to the entity, how do we know if those are the exact payments that are being made from the entity to the contractor? I mean, it could be that we're paying X amount and then a lesser amount is being paid to the contractor. And then the money is not really being appropriated very uh, frugally. I mean, we have no... We have no Bob, doesn't the, C the Community Preservation Committee receive copies of the bills that, and you have to vote on them and sign off on them That's exactly and it says the exact our, amount of money? Our, our rules are that uh, A, the bill that comes in has to be signed off by, by at least two or three members of the, of the 
body that's submitting it. And those are bills from the vendors, not from, those, those for are example, bills, the bills from, the, from the vendors. Okay. Then they come to the Community Preservation Committee, and our rules require a, a minimum of three signatures to be put on on that to be then handed to the town account. So when payment. the check goes out to the Sons of Union veterans, for example, it's not going out into the void. If the bill is for ten dollars, that's what the bill says. Correct. From the from the vendor. Correct. So there's no way Sons of Union veterans is making this up, for example. Right. I'm not getting a I'm not getting a bill from the Sons of Union ve Union veterans to pay. Okay. Uh, no, and that was that wasn't my concern. My concern is the the, the bill is coming in for the Sons of Veterans and you're writing a check out to them. You're not sending it directly to the contractor. We have no way of knowing if they're really receiving that amount of money. Well, the, the contractors are sending the Sons of Union Veterans the bills. Exactly. So they are telling the Sons of Union Veterans what they are owed. I, I don't see how, you know, unless they're in cahoots with the vendors and... And you don't know that. Well, and Jack, you, know. you were the tre treasurer for a lot of years. This has been going on for a long time. I, I don't understand. <laughs> What, are you trying to embarrass me now? No, yeah. I don't understand why you have a question that's, now. That's why I, I have a concern. I'm not the treasurer. All right, on the, all right. The slack but they're, I, they're that's enough back and forth. I, I do have a concern, though, you, about avoiding the procurement process. Why, why do we want to do that? Because private projects are not required to, to go through the pro, uh, follow the procurement laws. Okay. I mean, I, I don't think it's any, any attempt to avoid it. I think it's... Uh, and, and we so this is a viable way to pursue yes and, okay. and we we vet all of the private entities to make sure that they're not you know coming in with the highest bid uh, we, we think that you know we, we ask them enough questions so that we're uh, we're trying to be frugal with the town's money we're not trying to spend anything we're not trying to give anybody a reward for for uh, you know working with you know with the town okay all right other questions Members of the board. I have a concern though, Bob. Um, the, when we discussed providing the funds to the Sons of Veterans um, to rehabilitate that building, it was with the caveat that the public and civic organizations would be allowed to use that building, okay? And then I just got a notice from the Lions Club that they had been evicted out of there. And uh, so I have some concerns that they're not following the the, the intent of uh, what that was established for. Well, Mr. Weston may have an answer to that. Come on up here, Mark. I know that Mark Weston's here, but let yep. me let me speak first of all to yep. to the, the, the issue because um, I can't necessarily speak to the to the Lions Club, but I can speak to the fact that this the uh, work that's being done on the project is historic preservation restriction on the exterior of the building, uh, and and. According to state law, is that a historical building? That is a historical building, and it's on file with whom? Uh, Carver Historical Society. Oh, Carver Historical Society. Yeah, the requirement is it needs to be over 50 years old and on the historical commission. And it's list. on on the historical uh, commission's list. Okay, all right. Um, so the the way it works is that it's uh, private money can or pub public money can't go to a private purpose without getting a a uh, a benefit from it so what we have required of union church of united parish is that there be a historic preservation restriction placed on the exterior of the building which re requires that the building be, be maintained into into perpetuity on the exterior of the building so that they can't change the the ex the way the exterior looks uh it's that's critical because obviously we're trying to maintain the character of the town and that that is important uh we specifically haven't gone into the interiors of a lot of these buildings because everyone understands the importance or the, the uh, requirements of once you've gone on to the, into the interior, you have to start maintaining historic uh, restrictions there too and you have to allow uh, access from, from the public. But I know Mark is here to talk sure. about the, uh, the lions and I, I'm not prepared to talk about Mark, that. why don't you just identify yourself and address and yeah. address. Mark Weston, uh, 171 Main Street. I'm a member of the uh, Sons of Veterans, um, also a veteran, and that and I brought that up because uh, I'm going to give you about a three-minute history lesson, and I don't think anybody, most people in this room have no idea what that building is even about. But that building was built by the daughter of Major Thomas B. Griffith in 1913 as a memorial 
-hmm. to all veterans, okay? Well, at the time she built it in 1913, there was only four wars. It wasn't like she knew World War I and II and they were all coming, <laughs> okay? And she knew that they, the veterans were not gonna survive, so she put it and gave it to the Sons of Union veterans, camp number 132, okay, which we are, to keep that building in shape for a memorial for all veterans, all right? She took and put the, and took money and put it in stock back in 1914, which was like General Motors, GE, United Fruit, and if we could have kept that stock, <laughs> you wouldn't even be seeing us. Um, <laughs> but what happened was the government got involved in the 1930s or 40s before my time, and they said you can't do that. Uh, you have to take that and put it into public stocks and all of that, which pay. Well, they, we survived with it. Well, as of the last few years, like everybody else knows, um, we're making right now $10,000 a year. And with that $10,000 a year, we're paying around $3,000 on insurance, $2,500 on heat, um, not counting anything else that has to be repaired. We're just about staying above water. Thankfully to these people, we were able to redo the outside, the memorial, and I want to stress that. It's a war memorial. It's one of the few around. This woman went out and did it. Um, we're able to keep it, and I think it looks gorgeous. We came in under budget. Um, a lot of the members donated a lot of time and a lot of money out of their own pockets to help it. We came in in record time because it's our 100th year anniversary this year on Memorial Day. And when we were doing this, we had to clean the inside the hall and everything else. And what happened with the Lions, and I'll tell you right now, they're meeting right now, we are talking, the Lions Club and us had an agreement, I would say, you can't quote me on this, but it's six, maybe eight years ago. They were gonna rent it for $1,200 a year, and they were gonna help with some of the upgrades inside. We really needed help. Um, it worked out great. It was a great agreement between both of us. What happened was, as times change, memberships change, members change. Things get lost in the, pretty soon, the things that they were doing, they were supposed to meet downstairs all the time and only twice a year were allowed to come upstairs because we had the floors all redone and we didn't want to scratch them all up doing other things. Well, those things all went by the wayside. We emailed Alliance four times, maybe more, tried to get a meeting and uh, we wanted to get the place cleaned up, um, get it back to where it was. And it was, I think it was a lack of communications. I think it was a lack of communications on their part and our part. We haven't received rent for them since sometime in 2011. At the budget, we would, I, this is what I was told. I heard the thing behind me. <laughs> They're meeting on it tonight. Now you how we feel. Well, okay. <laughs> um, we have not, with the budget that we're working on, we can hardly afford to heat it ourselves, never mind heat it for other people and stuff and not collect something, okay? So we decided, we hadn't heard back from them with the emails, we met and we decided that let's terminate it. Since then, uh, I actually had talked to Ron Clark, um, I've talked to Frank Moscato, they're meeting tonight and I said, let's meet again. Our, our members got together and said, we don't wanna break this up, but we, and I think what we're gonna end up doing is we're gonna sit down and and meet and then when we do have a meeting these kind of rental things for this kind of building you have to renew them every year um, we one time rented it to a church to try and make money and that got so that they were supposed to have three keys and when they finally left they turned in 50 keys so I mean so you have to redo these and you have to go back right. every year yeah. and go over them. so right now as far as the Lions go they're not in the Sons of Veterans Hall but we are meeting with them, and we would love to work it back out again. Okay. So negotiations are ongoing. Negotiations are supposed to, as soon as they meet, we meet, then we're supposed to meet together. And the Sons of Veterans have no adversity to having civic organizations that want to utilize the facility. We right? do. I'm not going to say we don't. We have to meet on each one. We yeah. cannot afford yeah. to have somebody come in and say, 
we'd like to use your hall and we don't we don't want to pay you any rent no 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 that's not we what we can't saying. Afford, we yeah. can't hardly pay the heat now that's not what we're referring okay. to mark okay we we understand that there's a cost of maintenance and everything else over there but just that the building is available because it, it did turn out beautiful and it should be enjoyed by all the citizens of the town so that was that was our concern yeah, that it, it has to be as as the members meet yep. and it's certain criteria is set there has to be something where okay we get something for it sure and and it has to be okay and you're allowed to do this it's just like now we want to keep everybody off the grass um we just we just did that whole place and we laid out all that sod in looks beautiful one day yep um and we're trying to well when you do rent it out you can't let people park everywhere anymore so do you have a list of rules and stuff that we're you... going to we have to do that kind of thing okay. we have to set all of that up but that's where we stand right now but i just wanted this board and the, to people to realize that that is in a more memorial it's a okay. war memorial and if she was alive during world war one two vietnam career i'm sure they would have been included and it was made for and she wanted that to be a memorial just like the statue across the street right it's not just a hall that a bunch of guys go and meet at or anything and we're there to try to keep it in can a I, memorial. Can I make a couple comments? Sure. You know, this came before us. We discussed this when it came up, and we realized that it's for the veterans, and we supported it. And it went to town meeting, and town meeting supported it. So I, I think if you're going to thank this board or thank the CPC, I think you've really got to thank the taxpayers of this town. Absolutely. They're the ones that put the money in there, and they went to town meeting, and they followed our recommendations and a recommendation of CPC and approve that and that's what we did it for we figured i mean here's a memorial to the veterans and you just don't want it to fall in disrepair exactly and if, and if it wasn't for the help of the townspeople um it would have fallen in disrepair i mean the bricks mark, we had redone and everything else can you use the microphone mark oh. and, and that's what I we had discussed we had discussed really the historic nature of everything so like the, um, the paving and the grass and everything CPA money was used for all of that as well too. Right. We've and we came in like I said, we came in under budget and on time. And uh and because of a lot of work by a lot of people that are members there that put in on their own hours of non paid or anything else. And um it, it was quite an achievement. I was one very skeptical that we could come in by Memorial Day and have it ready to go and walk on actual grass. Um but um they did it and uh and I think it's something to be proud of. I think it's nice for the center of the town. Yes. Um, and I, and I, but I, I just, I wanted people to understand it's not just a hall. It's a war memorial building. And, and that's important to me as it well, is it, to vet, all veterans, I think. And it's a testament to your management of the facility and stuff. Because look at all the VFWs and everything else have fallen by the wayside. All right, we're going to move this along. Uh, any other questions from the board or comments? Oh, just thank Mark for the history lesson on the hall. Yeah. Mark, I think we're all on the same page, and we know you need to draw in funds to maintain that building. That wasn't the issue ever. The issue was that we thought that the public use was being cut off on it. That appears not to be the case. You guys are in negotiations, whatever they come out to be. That's fine. Thank you very much for coming in tonight. Okay. okay. Bob, what do we have for you? Do we have some votes that we need to cast? <laughs> On the CPA, CPC, is it tied into? Yes, and what is circulating right now is, a, is an updated, well, the version of the warrant. Um, the initial, the paperwork you have on the warrant, some pages must have stuck together, so you Good have enough. a full warrant coming around. Um, Need one more. Do that includes more? the uh, CPC yeah. articles. Oh. Check. So okay. in addition to the articles listed here, Mr. Chairman, um, you also need to add 26 through 30, which are the specifically the CPC articles. So if you want to take them out of order while Mr. Bentley is here. So do, do we have new sheets for the FinCon members that are here, too? It's, it's the same warrant. It's just uh, the same warrant. By the way, the FinCon did not have a quorum tonight, but they uh, were kind enough to the members to show up so that they could work with us on this. And if there's any questions, hopefully... Uh, we can get to the bottom of them. Uh, 
How about the general public? Does the general public have copies of this? So you can't follow along? I think uh, Elaine has uh, beat me to the draw. You guys want to grab some copies so you can follow along? Please feel free to do that. Rick, can you sure. possibly repeat what you just said? Because Absolutely. The, the no, the, on the agenda for this evening, you have a list of articles that have not yet been addressed by the Board of Selectmen uh, in terms of a recommendation. In addition to those articles, you need to add 26 through 30, which are the CPC articles. Um, so uh, we weren't sure if that was going to be addressed uh, under the appointment with Mr. Bentley or not. Okay. So, Are we going to have a problem with that where it wasn't posted? Yeah, it says um, yeah no, I don't think so. It's, uh, was it? Did you again, this was uh, to be just. Didn't you just, didn't you post an amended agenda or? Well, no. Yeah. No. We okay. expected we'd, that this would be discussed with Mr. Bentley during his appointment, so oh. you can you can handle it in either format you would yeah. like. Um, so th these are again 26 through 30 are the tabled annual town meeting warrants from your last meeting, uh, warrant articles. We might have to do these before town meeting, mm -hmm. just to be on the safe side. Yeah, because yeah. I mean we we didn't post it so. Well, the, the articles have actually been posted and discussed yeah. as, as Community Preservation Act articles. It was just the numbering changed. Right, right, but they're not posted on the agenda for tonight. So I think that's what we'll do is uh, we'll have our usual Board of Selectmen meeting, pre-town meeting. Yeah, we're usually there at 6.30 anyway, so. Will you be there at 6.30, Bob? He doesn't have to be. He doesn't have to be. He doesn't have to be. Well, I will be, but I might be other, otherwise occupied. I know. <laughs> <laughs> you can listen in with one ear. All right, so how about if we do that, Rick? Just Fine with me. Post it, Lane, if you could post that for 6.30, we'll do the meeting quick. Meeting. Is there anything else that we need to put on that 6.30 meeting beside these articles, Rick? Anything? Well, that would depend on what you do with the articles. With the rest of the articles, yeah. Okay. All right, so Robert, you're all set tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you. Very Thank enlightening. You, Thanks, Thank Bob. Thank you. Okay, review of the tabled annual town warrant articles from May 20th meeting, articles 2, 5, 31, 33, 34, 36, 37, 38, 39, and 40. And how do we want to approach these? Mr. Chair, isn't the only one that the numbering where the numbering hasn't been changed is in that articles two and five? Am I wrong, Rick? Did all the other numbers get changed? Uh, I thought we well, just tabled those. No, the, yes, but Elaine explained to me that that has already been updated. With these numbers reflect the updated numbering on the warrant. That has been updated. So why did we just table them? Because articles 26 through 30 weren't specifically listed in this item. Okay. So I you know, in one instance, we're, we're listing specific articles to address. In the other instance, I, we didn't even. Yeah. Thank you. All right, let's go with Article 2 then. See if the town will vote to fix the salaries of the elected town officers in accordance with General Laws Chapter 41 and Section 108 as amended and to raise and appropriate the proposed increases from the prior fiscal year. Namely, and if everybody can follow along with the list right there, Rick, you want to yeah. add anything to that? Y yes, um, it was my understanding that the reason you tabled this was because of some questions you had specifically with regard to the all, the uh, other compensation that the town clerk receives under. That's the correct, statute. right? And uh, the and we did get that information, right? And uh, some of that is specifically relevant to Carver. There are three areas that are relevant yeah. to Carver. Some of those the town hasn't accepted. Uh, the, the one issue, first issue, is a, is a, a portion of dog licensing fees. Right. Uh, the second one is uh, an amount of money for the uh, being the uh, the chief registrar of, of voters. Um, the third would be the stipend that the town has accepted of $1,000 for certification. That is not um, an issue at this point because the town clerk is, you can't be certified until you've been a, you're a town clerk. So it will become certified though, right, Lynn? Certified yeah. eventually. Okay. So, um, and Lynn, what, what, I'm sorry, what was the total amount between the dog license? Come on up to the mic, Lynn. Uh, and the uh, registrar of voters? Um, 
for it those ranges two? between uh, 1200 and about 1500 per year um, the registrar of voters is uh, 450 okay the, the board of registrars in the dogs it's, an, it's a job in addition to the town clerk's position so okay. it's an additional position and the dogs is it depends at 70 75 cents per dog and, um, and it was intended initially as an incentive for towns to get their dogs licensed but does it go to the town clerk or does it go to the town clerk's it, office it, it goes to the town clerk, it goes to the town town clerk. clerk right and that's 75 cents per license and that mm -hmm. totaled how much last year uh, it was twelve hundred dollars okay. and some change okay. so those two items the town clerk get right now currently gets whatever those numbers turn out to be on top of the salary that's listed here as the current and proposed is that correct Lynn? and Rick did you say those hadn't been accepted by the town or no, they those, had are been? The, those are the two that have been accepted there's other okay. information in the packet of sections yeah. that Lynn provided that have not been accepted mm -hmm. by the okay. town so those are the only two relevant points okay you mr. chair yes ma'am can we discuss without making a motion um, we should make a motion to approve I'll make the motion I'll make the motion we approve article 2 do we have a second second and we have a second now it's open to discussion okay. go right ahead ma'am um, we had talked about the uh, treasurer collector I'm, you know and the um, town uh, um, the town treasurer with the election and that these um, salaries had been based off of the two previous people serving, G. McGillicuddy and, um, and um, Jack Franny, who obviously had a lot more years of experience and um, longevity. So I just want to make a slight recommendation in fairness to what it's all about in terms of when, when you're coming in under with different experiences that um, exclusive of what we talk, just talked about because that should be added but what I did was to uh, be as fair in terms of my recommendation as possible is I went back on um, both the town clerk and the treasurer tax collector um, the town clerk all the way back to 1998 when Jean started and then um, Paul I went back to 2007 when Jack started and what I did was I basically kept in all of your cost of living raises okay so it, it, it's a pretty simple calculation that I did was for the town clerk um, 2003 and 2013 were the only times there were really substantial um, raises which I consider for the experience and the longevity so that was the only portion that I I personally deducted out that I think would be a fair start for um, a recommendation and the same with the treasurer tax collector Paula all I did was I took out um, that last increase for Jack um, of the in 2013 for three thousand nine hundred and fifty nine dollars so to, to make um, it as simple as possible what I'm recommending is that we amend the town clerk to salary to sixty two thousand two hundred and nineteen as a start and the um, Treasurer collector to seventy three thousand six hundred and eighty four dollars. And again, what I um, sixty two thousand two hundred and nineteen. And again, that's exclude. That's not including the um, what we just talked about the dog licenses and things. So I just wanted to hear your thoughts if you think that is a fair recommendation. I would like to address that um, first of all when I ran for the position I ran with the intention of inheriting the income as well as the responsibility I think the voters of the town knew that when they voted for me to be in this position I think they're educated voters and I think they knew what the salary was for the town clerk with that being said um, looking at your, your list here for the salaries mm -hmm. There were also several years where she did not get a raise, and I think that compensates for that. There was two years, but I took um, that all into consideration. I, I added back all the cost of living. There were so. there were three years that she didn't get a raise. I see 2010 and 2009, 2009. 2010. Okay, oh. so I'm sorry, 2009 she did, but that. 
that surprises me because when you were here last time, you actually said that you understand that you would consider, you know, taking out the longevity. And, and the, I uh, did. I took out the longevity, and I also took out the um, certification fee. Then I don't understand why you're going, saying that we should go in at the same. Well, initially, she was entitled to a raise this year, which, which we didn't put in for. Right. Uh, okay. Which makes sense. Okay. You know. well, that, that's my recommendation. Um, I, okay. And, so. and uh, my argument to that would be also I have managerial experience. You're not getting an, in, an inexperienced person in this position. Um, I've been in the, in the office for six years as well, so I have um, institutional knowledge as well. Okay. So that would be my argument. I'd like to address the um, issue also. Um, I'm going to state the same thing that when the voters voted me in, mm -hmm. um, I think they knew what the salary was going to be. Mm -hmm. uh, no one seemed to have a problem with that. Um, and to drop it down almost $4,000, um, that's quite a substantial amount. I had thought that I was coming in also at the amount that Jack was getting. Um, I am certified as a collector. I do not get a stipend for that. I've never been put in for that. Mm -hmm. um, I should have been when I got my, my um, certification. Um, and I am looking at um, from June 11th, 2007, the current salary for the town, um, the treasurer, was $7,513.27. Mm -hmm. And the proposed salary was seven thousand seventy thousand three ninety three fifty four, which is a difference of one hundred and nineteen dollars and seventy three cents. Um, it it just it's it's baffling to me that um, you would drop the amount almost four thousand dollars because Jack didn't get in. What? Yeah. And that's, that's exactly easy, what easy. it is. Oh, that's so unfair. Really? That's so, that is, that. That's so if Jack had gotten in, All we right. would not be talking about this, would we? All right, Paul. That's unacceptable. Oh. I'm sorry. Yeah, that's really unacceptable. I, I'm going by. Can I say something, Mike? <laughs> Go ahead, Jack. Wow. I, I do have to correct you, because if you look at your certificate you received from the Massachusetts Collective Treasurer's Association, it says, you're a certified assistant tax collector, not tax collector. No, it doesn't. Yes, it does. Go, go back and look at it. And there was no provision in there to give you any sort of That's increase right. because you, you have to be certified in both positions to get that. Okay. Steve Romano didn't get it until he was certified in both in of both them. Both areas. That's and correct. And I was a certified collector, and I, I mean treasurer, and I didn't even put in for it because, just to be fair, that's what it called for. Okay, where are, we, where are we at with this? I just had a couple of... Sure. Um, so I just wanted to get this right, uh, Lynn and Paula. Neither one of you were asking for any percentage increase over last year's uh, amount, correct? No, that's correct. correct. Okay, and so I guess my, I'm curious as to why this wasn't brought up prior to the election. It seems... It, it just seems, uh, I'll use the famous word, disingenuous again, oh and, and frankly unfair to these two people who ran uh, based on a certain assumption That's that not the correct. public knew about. That's not correct it's either so because Mr. LaFond and I had a conversation prior to the yeah, election. We did. About that. Uh, well, these two ladies apparently didn't, yeah. and they may not have run, had, had, not that it's only money, but I'm simply saying that that's not fair for, to them to have okay. but I just want two positions assuming that they're going to be paid a certain amount of money and yeah. then come to find afterwards that that's you know, right. arbitrary. All right, any other comments, questions? All right. This is my recommendation, that's all. Right. all. What are you doing, Helen? Are you making a motion? No, I'll just let you continue your vote. I, that was my recommendation. Mm -hmm. Just so you know, there is one motion on the floor currently. That's what I am. To approve the article as written, right? Right. So, <coughs> do we have a second? I, I, I may 
need a second. We have a motion and a second. Okay. Any future, further rather, discussion? Comments, no. recommendations? Hearing none. If all those in favor, please say aye to Article 2. Article aye. 2. Aye. Those opposed? I abstain. One abstention. Okay. All right. Article, Article 5. five. Article 5. And uh, you're not in a position until after our meeting in executive session tonight to take any action on that. So. Okay. So that's tabled until after executive we session. Make a motion. We table Article right. 5. Do we have to come back into regular session to? Uh, I, I would suggest that uh, you would probably want to uh, take a vote before town meeting on whatever you, if you come to a conclusion tonight okay. on these, just at our next meeting. All right. So there's a motion to table. So we can include that with the CPA yeah. articles before right. the meeting. Okay. Right. Motion to table. Do we have a second? Second. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion on that? Okay, the uh, article is tabled until our 6.30 p.m. meeting on June 3rd. Article 31 on page 9 of the warrant would be the next one, Mr. Chairman. This is the 31 percent. I make a motion we approve. I'll second. We have a motion and a second on Article 31, which is uh, the article that deals with the reduction of the Community Preservation Act uh, surcharge from 3% to 1%. Uh, um, any further discussion on that? Seeing as how we already addressed it with Mr. Bentley a little earlier. None? Right. Bencom, do you have anything you want to add to that? Uh, we actually came Did you? We wanted to hear what Mr. Bentley presented. Okay. All right. Before Tommy, mean. okay, very good. Right, and if I could again just to clarify, the um, if should the town mm -hmm. pass this, um, it would go on the next election, town election next next year. So the town meeting action is not the final action, but it's right. a step in the process. Right. The wheels of government turn ever so slowly. Okay, so for Article Thirty One, we have a motion and a second. Uh, hearing no further discussion, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed. Aye. No, I'm I'm for letting the voters decide. I, I personally am in favor of keeping it at 3%, but I think the voters should decide. Okay. Yeah. So 410. Okay. 33, moving on. And 30, 33 and, and 34 were submitted by the police chief. Chief? I'm just here if anybody had any questions. Uh. <laughs> One deals with political signs, and I probably shouldn't assume, but I am going to assume that this pertains to all elections. Yes. Not just town? No, state, all elections. State, federal, everything? Everything. Okay. Now, you bringing that part up, one of the things when I looked at some other towns, just so people in the audience, if they don't have this or at home, what this basically is trying to do is we have an issue where the polling place is the high school quite often at 11:59 p.m. on a Friday night because the <laughs> polls are on Saturday morning we have a group of people bring your boxing gloves and I've actually in the past had to put people on overtime up there to referee where signs go um, you know I understand when people run for office they get a lot invested in it and everything but this just seems to make it a lot easier that seven o'clock in the morning or an hour before the polls open i wrote it so it would take care of whatever one happens you can start putting your signs up and take them down an hour after now a number of towns have where they they basically have to have somebody live standing there with the sign and i thought that would be a little unfair for state federal uh, obviously somebody running for a state rep slot they need to be in two or three towns uh, district attorney, the sheriff, all the, th there's too many places for too many people to be. So they can still put their signs up an hour before the poll, the polls open. 
and they can take them down an hour after it ends, but they don't need a live person standing there with them. So um, that's for everybody, right? That's for everybody. Yeah. Okay. It, it doesn't matter whether it's the president yeah. or uh, you know you're running for I don't know whatever you run for in this town, <laughs> whatever you want to run for, whatever seats we don't have open and somebody writes in for, you know. Dog, dog officer. Okay. I didn't want to say dog officer. That would narrow down a profession <laughs> that I have a lot of respect for. Thank you. All right. Any questions on that article by the members of the board? Jack? Geez, I remember a few years ago, the police department was mad at a couple of selectmen, and they actually had signs printed, and they had them up there. Does that apply to them, too? Well, they can put it up an hour before the polls open and <laughs> take them down an hour after. Any further questions on Article 33? For you, Mr. Chair, Mike, do you think there's that much contention with the state elections and that would have to be that strict because it is so much more difficult for uh, on the, on those levels to go to the different towns to get the signs up? I've I've never seen anybody out at 1159 p.m. run somebody's running for a rep. So that's what I mean. I mean uh, you know what I mean. If that's what I mean. If it's down that night, I don't think anybody's going to be standing there with a stopwatch making sure the thing gets down. Right. Um, but, I mean, we've had some crazy things over the years from people putting them up the day before not knowing. And it's I the water. The, it's right. the water. Oh, I had a garage <laughs> full of signs the day before an election, and some people rather upset, and I don't know how I ended right. up with a garage full of signs because it was abandoned <laughs> property, and it's just a nightmare. So this just simplifies it. I mean, short of putting squares out there and drawing straws after this, I don't know what else to do to make it fair, even, and, and so it's just not a burden on mainly on the police to, to try and police these things that I really have no legal right to police. Right. Will there be a fine? Or are you just going to No, we'll have take the, the right sign down and tell them down they can't put it. Yeah. Okay. They'll be in the garage <laughs> along with all the other ones that the kids steal during the weeks leading up to the elections. Any other? Is that where they are? Yeah. I, I didn't collect many this year. I don't know what 50 a campaign. Is that where they are? Some. <laughs> So I'll make a motion to approve Article 33. Second. Okay, I think we were going to lump them both together, but uh, that's well, okay. You want me to quickly go over Article 33? I apologize. 30? Okay. Yeah. All right, Article 34 is it's basically oh. a way to... to um, you had gone through this in detail before. Didn't well, you? It, it's, been quite, it's been amended quite a bit since the okay. one that I put in for special, uh, special town meeting in the fall. What it's going to deal with is, is secondary goods, and I've already had some people call me up or stop by because they were concerned about like thrift stores. Mm -hmm. um, it's not going to really deal too much with them or impact them because if you're consigning stuff, you're taking the person who's going to sell it with you, uh, their information. I have yet to find thieves who are willing to give their real name and address to somebody to then co-sign and hope that somebody buys whatever they stole in the next few days to get their money. I don't know. We've got a few of them that gave well, us their addresses. They're, uh, if they're willing to take that much time and effort, then they probably deserve to get some cash out of it. But what this is trying to do is mainly take care of pawnbrokers to buy in the gold, the silver, uh, secondhand metals. So right now in town, there should only be two businesses that will really be affected by it. Um, and what we're trying to do is I've tried to make it so it's, it's not as strict as neighboring towns. For example, uh, who just did it? Hanover did it. 30 days. They have to hold whatever they buy. If they come in and buy gold today, they got to hold it for 30 days before they can melt it down, sell it, or whatever. The reason for the holding is to give us an opportunity to try and get back stolen goods. Um, so what I did is I, I spoke to mainly Kava Jewelers because it affects them the most. And, uh, you know, you don't want them having to hold on to something so long that they're losing money on it. You know, precious metals go up and down but give them something reasonable and also a reasonable amount of time for a victim to figure out that they've had some jewelry stolen, report it to us and, and have us try and hunt it down. So they've got to hold on to, uh, I believe it's 20 days according to this. And there's a process for giving IDs. There's, they have to have a photo ID. The burden on the shopkeeper is going to be they're going to have to photograph the merchandise, the ID, um, and they're going to have to uh, report it to us. We take part in a uh, software system that was developed by a Rockland detective that puts into a database that all the police departments that belong to it can see pictures of all the stuff. And obviously, if you come up with something that's kind of unique, uh, we can go and search for that type of jewelry. If we find it, 
and Helen, as you know, that's how we found a bunch of stuff. Um, and, and, it's, yes. and it's rare for us to get it back. This will also help protect the shop owner because if they unwittingly take in something stolen, if they've documented it, then we know they're on the up and up. And we can also charge the person um, with larceny by false pretense by selling to the shopkeeper stolen goods. So we can try and take care of the victim here, and we can try and take care of the victim where it was stolen from. Um, it's very in-depth. I sent two sergeants off to a school <laughs> to go over this. The, this is based on um, best practices, mainly coming out of Florida where they had a huge problem with it. And they basically eliminated uh, a lot of pawn shops, you know, fly-by-night places yeah. by putting these rules in. I tried to balance it out as best I could so the shopkeeper can still make money and, and do what they need to do and also protect everybody involved. Um, it's, it also leaves a little bit of wiggle room with the reporting. I don't expect them to have to uh, join this database. However, if they're reporting to us electronically like once a week or once every 10 days, we can upload it uh, according to the guy who built the software. So it'll be, um, it, it shouldn't be a big burden on anybody. Mm -hmm. And it'll also save us, uh, when I mean us, the police department and taxpayers, a lot of time uh, and investigations because a lot of the information that we have to hunt down otherwise is right there for us. Um, the other thing is, like I said, I don't want to discourage business by, from this town at all, but I just can't, we just can't have We Buy Gold places popping up everywhere and uh, it's just going to be com incredibly time consuming for the police department to be chasing down all the stolen stuff that goes through there. So I know it's lengthy, and, and, but we tried to keep it in line with other dealers' license. I believe it's $50 a year. Um, and, you know, they, if they choose to go on to the, uh, the database uh, as opposed to reporting directly through us, it, um, it's going to be a, no more than, I think, $140 a year for a license. Um, the other thing is it also protects the shopkeeper in that if they're reporting to us and they're buying three or four times, you know, three or four times in a month from the same person, and we're looking at the database seeing that this guy's selling stuff in Wareham and Plymouth too, then we can kind of give them a heads up that, hey, you might not be uh, wanting to buy from this person anymore because it's probably stolen. So it, it's really, it's a safeguard, and I tried to balance it on as best I could to be fair to the business owners as well as, uh, as, well as the police and, and any victims. Thank you. Any further questions from the board? Chief, I think it's pretty safe to say that Carver Jewelers is a fairly reputable uh, jewelry store here he, in town. He's very reputable. I, I don't mean to imply that. Yeah. Like I said, he... Well, I, I wanted to mention that. Yeah, so no, the I'm... one that would be impacted would be him, and you brought up a lot of other things, and I just wanted to clarify that. No, I, I, I've spoken to them, and, and again, I talked to them, and, and that's why we... Uh, we decided on cutting the days back. The standing around here is 30 days. Right. And uh, he told me 20 days was reasonable for him, so that's why I cut it back a little. He's also been a victim. He's, he's unwittingly bought stolen things. I mean, mm. it, it definitely is there to protect the shopkeeper as well. But no, Cava Jewelers, I have absolutely no problems with. It's very, very uh, reputable uh, business. Anything else? Just that I'll make a motion to approve both Article 33 and 34. Second it. I have a motion and a second. Any further comment? Hearing none. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? And one abstention away. Okay. Thank you. Okay, moving on to Article 36. A gift of land known as Julian Grove. I think I have raised an objection to this when we had it the last time, and I just wanted to see if there was any sort of documentation from whoever might have set up a trust, what had to be done. I just didn't want to be incurring any future liabilities for the town. I don't know if, Rick, if you had an opportunity to check with anyone and get any information along those lines, because that's what it seemed like some of these articles referred to. Yeah, um, yeah I was hoping Clark could be here. Anybody, anybody's better than. We'll take anything from anywhere, Ellen. Step on up. 
try and move this along. It's 10 after 9 now. Yes, I'd like to get to my thing on the yeah. agenda. Um, Julian Grove is down in South Carver. It was created to uh, be a place for the South Carverites to um, enjoy the outdoors and gather together and so on. It's right between, it's on Wareham Street and it's right between, um, well, it's just past the Faith Baptist Church. And what, what they did was they've um, cut off, they've made it into a pretty much square by give it, selling to the church and selling a little bit to the um, person who lives at the corner of Seapit and Wareham because the, his driveway was going across part of it anyway. So um, it's, it's tax exempt property, so there are no back taxes involved or anything. And it was just, it was intended for the uh, people of Carver to enjoy. Is that the parcel that's all cleared out now, right next to the church? That was the part they sold to the church. That was the part they sold to the church, okay. Yes. All right, I know what you're talking about now. Yeah, it's, it's all woods. Yeah. And there's a, a plaque in there. Any uh, motions from the board? I just want to make another comment that in Article 38, it says, um, Park for Recreational Services subject to restrictions and conditions exist in, in the Declaration of Trust dated September 8, 1915 and duly recorded at Registry of Deeds. I was just concerned that we weren't going to be in, incurring any liabilities for accepting this. I, I think it's a great idea to accept it, but I just want to see what's in that Declaration of Trust. Um, Is, I do you have, have a copy of it? Uh, yes. And um, I've forgotten now who the original trustees were, but they've been passed down generationally, pretty much. Um, and Clark Griffith is one of the trustees. And off the top of my head, I can't remember who the other two were. But um, they are, you know, they've just maintained the property for the benefit of the town. So there's nothing that the town has to do in current any liabilities to do any additional things down there? That I wouldn't have any idea to yeah. speak to. I don't, I don't it, think, I know. Uh, it's been vacant for yeah. over 100 years. Yeah. I know it has, but I'm just wondering if it had money in it originally. They must have spent some money. So I, I was just concerned if yeah. we're going to be taking this over, we're we picking up some liabilities. Could you get a copy of the Declaration yeah, of we Trust? Can, we can tr get, do what we can and again see if Clark can maybe come in and. It says to acquire by gift or otherwise a certain sum of money for the maintenance and support of, the, of that land in the town of Carver, known as Julian Grove. It, that almost implies to me that there is a fund somewhere something established. Correct. To turn over to the town. I don't know how much is in it. I don't exactly. That that's the there only might reason. not be anything in it, and there might be something that we have to do. All right, so with the pleasure of the board, do you want to put this on for Monday, too? Yeah. Make a motion we table till Monday. Is that 36 and 38, both of them, Jack? Yes. 36, 37, well, and 38. All three of them. I'm sorry. Yeah. Together, yeah. yeah. And Rick, can you try and get a copy of that declaration? Might, might be nothing, but I just want to be on I the safe side. see what we can find. All right. Okay, so we have a motion to table those three. Is there a second on that? Second. We have a motion and a second. Any further comment, discussion? concerns. Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Jack, you voting? Table up. Unanimous. It's getting late. Mm -hmm. All right, what else do we have? Uh, uh, 39 and 39 40. 40. 40. Except the public way, Marion Drive, Jack, I had to talk about that. Um, yes, the, I, I think I briefed the board at the last meeting and the planning board did finalized their hearing last Tuesday and voted 4-0 to recommend approval. Marion Drive, this is critical to uh, the DECAS project as well as to the sale of the property to Agway or CPS. I make a motion we approve Article 39. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any further comment, questions, concerns, recommendations? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? It's unanimous. Article 40. Um, Article 40 is the map change for South Carver on Federal Road, and this is a joint, well, it's sponsored by the planning board, but it was at the request to make peace, and I know they're here to give a very right. brief, I 
stress brief presentation. I think I briefed the board last time. It's right. in conjunction with Ocean right. Spray's um, receiving plan, and the planning board voted 4-0 to recommend approval. You guys have been very patient. I appreciate that. I know it's been kind of long and drawn out. Come on up and explain to everybody. Mr. Chairman, can I, before they, why they yep. set up, you also forgot 35 on the agenda. I think you're going to need to push that to um, 630. I'll make a motion we table that till Monday. Well, it's not on the agenda, that's all. Didn't we vote on that last time? I don't time? think you did. I think you were waiting for the planning board. Yeah, we were waiting for the board. Oh, okay, all right. Yeah, yep. they do. So we'll add 35 to that then. Yeah. So we'll do that at 630. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Absolutely. Thank you. Chairman, board members, good evening. My name is Lawrence Winokur. I represent the Make Peace Company, and with me here tonight is George Rogers from the company and Bill Madden from GAF Engineering. Just quickly on the handout, uh, I, and I'll try to be brief given the hour, uh, the fact sheet I'm going to ask Mr. Rogers to go through with you. Uh, the next page is a copy of a compiled assessor's map, and the site is shown in yellow. Uh, the next pay page is uh, sort of an overlay of the immediate area, and I'm going to ask Bill to go through that with you. Uh, the next sheet is uh, a carve of roads, and uh, they speak for themselves. Uh, the next couple of sheets are the legal description for the area in question. Uh, the next two items are letters from Van Ness and Associates, the uh, traffic engineering company. Uh, the first, February 6th. The second, a week later, supplementing that. Uh, the next sheet is uh, a letter from Ocean Spray indicating its uh, agreement to the rezoning. Uh, the next sheet, <coughs> excuse me, uh, is the penalty tax that would be due to take this area out of Chapter 61A, and that's $21,588 and change. Uh, the Make Peace Company owns 199 acres and Ocean Spray 102 acres. <coughs> off Federal Road, which is currently zoned residential agricultural and shown on the compiled assessor's map uh, that I just uh, went through with you. Uh, the Planning Board, as Jack has indicated, unanimously voted to sponsor this zoning am amendment last week. The property is situated on the southeasterly side of Federal Road in an area perhaps best described as somewhat remote insofar as residences are concerned. Uh, the Make Peace Company would like to develop a soil mixing and blending facility on its land, which is prohibited in an RA zone, but allowed in an industrial A zone by special permit from the Planning Board. Uh, this would be subject to the Planning Board's extensive review under the special permit process, which I will allude to momentarily. The rezoning of this property does not give them the right to do anything. It would just allow them to file a, per, a special permit application uh, and go through that process, and the decision would ultimately be up to the planning board. Ocean Spray uh, has indicated its agreement to rezoning of its land as, as shown by that letter. Make Peace engaged the traffic engineering firm of Van Ness and Associates to submit a report on any traffic impacts, including directional trip distribution and any traffic increases anticipated by this proposed use. And its conclusion is that minimal increase in traffic and no material increase in motorist delays or queuing can be anticipated on Federal Road, Cranberry Road, or any relevant intersections. One other item they do 
state in their report is that for most of the year eighty percent of the traffic will go south not all of the year but most of the town plan has been consulted at every step of this process and excuse me the planning board has indicated a voter to approve at its public hearing last week uh, this proposal and to present it as sponsor at the town meeting we have submitted to you the projected rollback tax information of over twenty one thousand five hundred dollars the zoning amendment process is outlined in mass general laws chapter 40 a section 5 and has been followed by mr. hunter to a T I'm sure in terms of any potential impacts with respect to noise dust buffering traffic etc I just want to quote to you uh, from section 5300 of your zoning bylaw and among other consideration that the special permit granting authority uh, can make in this case the planning board would be the social economic or community needs which are served by the proposal traffic flow and safety including parking and loading adequacy of utilities and other public services neighborhood character and social structures impacts on the natural environment potential fiscal impact including impact on town services tax base and employment it goes on to say that the board may impose conditions if it deems uh, them appropriate a special permit may be granted with such reasonable conditions safeguards or limitations on time or use including performance guarantees as the uh, in this case the planning board may deem necessary to serve the purposes of this bylaw the point is that by changing the zoning uh, make peace does not have a permit to do anything all it has is the right to submit a special permit application to the planning board public notice is advertised notice goes to all abutters within 300 feet advisory opinions are sought from other public boards uh, and all of the things that I've mentioned are considered by the planning board if it deems fit to allow the special permit it can do so and with the conditions uh, that they think are appropriate at this point I'd like to ask Bill Madden to highlight the site for you and then George Rogers for his overview of make pieces plans and this project including the projected tax revenue and CPA fees as well as the minimal impacts on the neighborhood and the town thank you Bill you want to take the mic and take it right up there with you there you go thanks very much um, I'm Bill Madden from GAF engineering and I'll just uh, briefly describe the uh, the 301 acre locus and we'll start on the east side of the property there's a river called the Wankinko River and forms the boundary between the town of Carver and the town of Plymouth and that happens to flow in a southwesterly direction down toward Federal Road so what we selected to do is since that was a very identifiable feature um, the being the town line we chose to use that as one of our boundaries for the uh, for this proposed zoning district change we then intersected the Wankinko River with some agricultural land that is down to the uh, to the southern southerly end of the property and uh, made a couple of jogs into the into the land and then headed essentially in a northerly direction along the layout line of Federal Road Federal Road does have a, a layout that's recorded at the Registry of Deeds so we simply followed that layout as part of the boundary of the zoning district that again simplified the uh, the survey requirement of, of the property and gave us something that was very very um, definitive in nature we'd head northerly on federal road and um, we intersect a, a an east-west line um, with federal road and essentially it's a line that parallels the ocean spray ocean spray plant on the east to west line um, as we head easterly along that northerly line we then also intersect a pretty large um, traveled way agricultural roadway through uh, the make peace property and we headed again in a southeasterly direction to the point of the beginning which was the intersection of that river so altogether um, including the ocean spray property and make peace land there's um, approximately 301 acres of, uh, of property there as you can see there's a lot of it that's um, agriculturally used currently the area of the proposed soil blending facility is 
this area here where um, a previously permitted earth removal activity has taken place, and that represents 29 acres, and that's the area on which uh, the project Larry described, and George will give you a little more detail on, is, uh, is planned to be, um, a, a permit is planned to be applied for. This topography here? Yeah, you have about a 30 foot elevation change um, from the bottom side of this pit to say where the cranberry bog is up to the north. And that cranberry bog, I think it's uh, one kinko, right, George? One kinko bog, the big one? Yes. Yeah, and that um, you can see, you can, you can basically see right across to, uh, to uh, Cranberry Road. Um, it's over a mile away. It's about about 4,700 feet to the corner of the property line, about one mile to here, and uh, down in a depression about 30 feet in depth. Thank you. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. I'm George Rogers, Senior Vice President, AD Make Peace Company, Corporate Offices, 158 Tyhonet Road, Wayham, Mass. The fact sheet you have before you uh, talks about three projects, and the reason for that is we went through the state MEPA process for these projects. Um, the one in Cava we're here to talk about tonight, but it is tied into one in Plymouth, which is right across the river, where we're proposing to build 140 acres of Midwest-style upland bogs to replace some of our river-run flow-through bogs. In addition to that, we're proposing a bypass canal in our Frogfoot bog system, which is in the towns of Plymouth and Carver, in the meantime, before we replace that bog. So it's an environmental project um, to run the water around the bogs rather than through them, and ultimately replace them bogs with a bog, new bogs. Um, that project is going to produce a fair amount of sand that will be used on some of our existing bogs, and it'll also go through the proposed uh, facility, blending facility, and we'll also use the facility probably to blend soils to build the bogs. Um, what we're talking about is multiple buildings, uh, steel buildings to store sand, um, leaf compost, clay, um, and other things that we would mix, and also the finished products, open buildings, open sided, but uh, landscape architects now requires to keep the, the soils dry, um, either the uh, raw product and the finished product at times. Um, also some sort of a scale house and office there to measure things and to do the billing and stuff. We picked this site um, mainly because it's in the, kind of in the middle of Makepeace's 6,000 acre central core parcel, the 6,000 contiguous acres there. We're behind the ocean spray facility, which you could say is somewhat industrial, and north of the landfill, which you can classify however you would like. So we try to stay in an area adjacent to those two things. And that's what our intent is to build multiple metal buildings down in a low elevation there and be out of sight, out of mind. Um, the fact sheet does talk about um, at full build out, um, we're projecting the facility could cost us about $5 million at the current tax rate. That would amount to uh, a tax assessment of about $113,000 a year and the CPA funds of about $3,400 at your current tax rate at full build out at $5 million. Um, and we would really like to work in Carver. We looked at another site um, that wasn't going to work out for us. We're currently operating out of Canton, Mass on a lease it's due to expire, um, so we're looking to find a new home, and we've selected Carver, and hopefully Carver will select us to uh, work together on this. If you have any questions, we have the answer. We'll open it up to the board. Jack, go ahead. Um, you mentioned um, there'd be a building where raw materials would be stored. Yes. Uh, would they... Would these raw materials ferment or anything and cause an odor? No. I'm, what I'm talking about is clay from Pennsylvania, uh, dried sand. There's no relatively no odors associated with that. In, uh, in the whole 301 acres is not industrial right now. Is it, is it all 61A or 
Yes. Oh, I don't, I can't speak for Ocean Spray Pot. Yeah. Makepeace used to own the Ocean Spray Pot, so we sold that to them. I don't know how theirs is classified, but everything else here would be in 61 and you're anyway. in, in that 301 acres, you're going to be building a series of four acre bogs. Did I misinterpret that? That's on the Plymouth side of the river. Okay. That's over here across the river in Plymouth. Okay, you had that in here. So yes. I, I thought all of this pertained to Kava. No, the Kava part is the soil blending facility. Plymouth is the new bog construction, and Plymouth and Wayham are jointly together in the bypass. Canal. So by virtue of converting this parcel, we're gonna, you're going to generate an additional $113,000 in taxes for the town of Kava? At full build-out. Okay. Of a projected of $5 million facility. And that's primarily the series of buildings that you're going to be building? Buildings and infrastructure. Okay. All right. Sir? Thank you, George. You mentioned that you had gone through the MEPA process. For those viewers at home who don't know what that is, could you give them a brief rundown? <laughs> the state process basically where you propose a project and every regulatory authority has a shot at you to respond to your proposed project and we went through this process and could um, you tell them what MEPA stands for Massachusetts environmental policy. and and so what was the outcome of that we have a certificate if you if as you know if you exceed certain thresholds either in area traffic uh, parking or what have you then you have to go to the, through the MEPA process and I, they I know I just didn't think the viewers at home would know yeah. anything else sir okay. no. Dick the uh, bogs in the southern part of that parcel they're going to stay cranberries yes This is pretty much behind the uh, Ocean Spray plant, you said, right? Yes. So, so it's not going to even be visible from uh, Federal Road, for the most part. No, the office building could be located at the entrance, right here, and that could be. But they're going to be up around the corner, out of sight, out of mind. So it's virtually going to have no impact on, on anything. Right. And you said most of the traffic, 80 percent of the traffic, is heading south towards Wayham, because yes. we have had an issue with some of the um, earth removal and the residents of Cranberry Village. I've had a couple of complaints about that. And I, I talked to Gary Garretts and he works with you guys and stuff on that, so. Yes. Okay. Anything from the FinCom? Any questions, Ryan? I, I actually had a question through, through, you, through you, Mr. Chair, as, just as a citizen. Uh, on the truck traffic, I noticed, noticed it says here uh, 100 to 200 truck trips a day. Are there any residents down there? Uh, any homes right there? That the trucks will be going past? Not in Cabo? No. Not if they're heading south. Right. Yeah. yeah. If they head north or east or whatever there, then, then we got a cranberry village issue. Any any, uh, any road repair that would that fall under the earth removal committee uh, or would that be something you've looked at? Uh, That's something they'd work out with the planning board because they'll put some stipulations on them and right. But if, if there's any, I, I think I know what you're getting at Andy. I think that it, the planning board will probably address that in their meeting with these folks to cover that so that they're not beating the roads to death and we're winding up paving them every year and stuff and right. it's coming out of the taxpayers money I know do you mr. chair yes, just to clarify this is um, just to change the residential zone so you will have permission and be able to go out for a special permit and then all that work all those this um, planning board and earth removal I just wanted to make sure I understood too is, it, is this a 20-year project? Is that what you have for a timeline on this? The Plymouth project could be 10 to 20 okay. years, depending on the earth removal that they allow us. With creating the bogs over there and yes. everything. Okay. I make a motion we approve Article 40. Second. I'll second. I have a motion and multiple seconds. Any further comments, questions, concerns, recommendations? Hearing none. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? It's unanimous. Thank, Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you for your patience tonight, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. Okay. Yeah, I was going to. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to take a couple of minute break here. Give everybody a chance to stretch their legs, get some water or whatever.
know if it's it. I don't know if it's it. <laughs>
try and get through this as quickly as we can, get everybody home safely. On? You up next? I am. Okay. Because I was falling asleep. <laughs> All right. Next on the agenda is a discussion with the assessors for review of records and parcels related to the Department of Revenue, May 16, 1977 memo to assessors regarding guidelines concerning application of General Law Chapter 61A. Oh. And that will be Ellen Blanchard addressing that for us. Well, I didn't ask to be on the agenda, so whoever wanted me on I, the agenda might it, be asking it was me, me questions. And if you read it, I don't know if anyone read this, but uh, basically it says you can have so many acres of upland per acre of bog. So I wanted the assessors to come and uh, discuss this with us and to see if they felt that um, the number of acres of upland per acre of bog is within line of this memo. Of course it is. Well, my concern was is that <laughs> I'm done. <laughs> my 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 concern was is and I had received these back in 2010 and 2011 at value credits report from the uh, assessor's office and basically for That's right. for 2010 um, the credits that they gave to reduce the um, cranberry land on the 61A was. Um, one hundred twenty-five million nine hundred and ten thousand dollars seven hundred, and that translated into two point five million dollars that is is not paid by the cranberry industry and is spread out through the rest of the taxpayers in this town. It just seemed to be pretty high to me. Well, when you can well, let me pass these. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. A little history first. Um, chapter 61 was the original chapter for what we fondly referred to as chapter land. It was um, added to the state laws in 1941. There was nothing, and it was only for the taxation of forest products, basically. Had to do with forestry, no agriculture. In 1973, chapter 61A was added. And by 1977, which is when this letter came out, there had been some, um, discussion between cranberry growers and assessors of, and the Department of Revenue specifically and probably with the Farmland Valuation Advisory Commission um, about how to value cranberry bogs and upland and non-productive properties. So um, they um, added the, this, the 61A. In 1979, they added um, Chapter 61B, which is recreation, and in 1981, they added the classification of forestry to Chapter 61. Um, now, the Family Evaluation Advisory Commission is, uh, hires a consultant who is a um, professor at UMass Amherst. He is in what used to be the Stockbridge School in the agriculture and he does, he's an economics professor. So he understands how all of this works. And it used to be that the, um, I believe it was the Farm Credit Bureau used to um, give the numbers to uh, the farmland, the FVAC. 
and so that they could figure out what the values per acre should be. Um, cranberry production, as you know, is so dependent on the weather and the seasons and um, what the market will bear for them. Um, there, were, there were years that they had wonderful crops, but they didn't have any place to sell them. They had to put them in freezers in Canada. Um, so the, there was a lot that um, was involved and is involved to this day. So if you think of cranberry growers as you would a vegetable farmer or a fruit farmer, they're farmers. That's what they are. They work 24-7 on their properties because that's their business. That's where they make their money. They earn their living that way. Um, farmers have been subsidized by the federal government and uh, I don't even know how long that is and more recently by the state, state. When they set these values, what they're doing is they're reducing the, the market value down to this income-based property value per acre. So what I gave you first, the first page, is um, the chapter land recommended value for FY13. The next page is a parcel, just to show you how it's done, that, um, and this is an actual parcel in town. Um, there's 51.2 acres, so it, it meets that first criteria of having a minimum of five acres and they are classifying the entire parcel in Chapter 61A. They have, now, for this to be correct, for them to make the right amount of money in order to remain in chapter, and when I say remain in chapter, they have to have a lien put on their property, not for the purpose of collecting anything, but for the purpose of notifying the next person to purchase it that this has been receiving a subsidy and that there would be rollback taxes for the current year or the previous four should they change the use of the property. Mm -hmm. So they have to make at least $500 a year. It's one of the uh, parts of uh, Chapter 61A. So the value per acre of necessary related land, for example, is $5 an acre, but non-productive land is 50 cents per acre. So you can see how that's broken down there. On this third page in your handout, um, it shows this particular parcel of 51.2 acres has 13.9 acres of bog, 15.6 acres of necessary related land, and 16.5 acres of non-productive land. So the required income would be 1,476.25. This person made over $40,000 on the um, and that's a, a gross amount, that's not a net amount. So if you look at this letter from the um, Department of Revenue, that was, I think it was Harry Grossman that wrote it. He, no, it was from Owen, Owen Clark, Clark, who was the commissioner. Um, and actually, by the way, should you have any uh, thoughts about this, in October of 2005, I did send a memo to the Board of Assessors and CC'd um, Mr. LaFond on, on this, on chapter land valuation with this letter attached. And um, there was also a letter about um, gravel and soil extraction that was attached to this and um, well, actually two letters about gravel extraction and sale that are part of the of doing business as a cranberry grower. So um, the letter states that the relationship or the ratio from bogs to upland is a 40-60% split. 40% bogs to 60% necessary related land. Then you add those two together and there's a one-to-one -one ratio between that and non-productive land. Now, according to the Department of Revenue, it's a rule of thumb. And um, 
as you can see in this instance the um, property owner actually has more acreage in bogs the a little bit less in necessary related and no a little bit more I'm sorry um, in necessary related and quite a bit less in um, the non-productive acreage if you turn to the fourth page these are the, the value ranges necessary related is hundred and sixty dollars and hundred and sixty dollars in value per acre non-productive land Thank is forty dollars per acre in value and then cranberries are broken down below average average and above average so going by that rule the 40 60 rule and then the one-to-one -one ratio one acre of bog would have be valued at 2409 as an above average bog one and a half acres of necessary related land um, 160 plus a half plus 80 and two and a half acres of non-production at 40 to make five acres and that shows you the 40 60 I actually didn't multiply them out I did however with the next example which is the parcel that we were just looking at and how the actual um, value is as opposed to using just r the ratios so I wasn't sure about why you know I, I wasn't approached about this so I wasn't even sure why I was I was being asked to be here um, So that's why I did, I showed you what we do every day, which is every year with all the, the chapter land um, applications that come in. Now, now you know where the values come from and how we do it, how we review every, you know, and this, they have to do one application per parcel so that we can value each parcel properly because some parcels although they're all contiguous one might have bogs on it white one might be upland and one might be non-productive but you add it all together because it is one farm um, so the farmland valuation advisory commission sets the values the dor will not allow you well they they discourage you from trying to figure out what you think the values should be and they don't use market values even though that's how we back into the chapter 59 value chapter 59 is our valuation law so that we can figure out what a value per acre is for bog my, my whole concern about this has been have these values remained relatively stable for the past 10 or 15 years? I mean, why is there such a disproportionate amount flowing back to the, I'm, I don't have anything against it's cranberry growers. It's not flowing back the, anywhere. I, I'm just thinking there's another $2.5 million that uh, is being levied on the rest of the town because of this. Yes and no, because the value of all of that land it first of all it, it provides open space for the town secondly because it's a commercial entity it, it's at the commercial tax rate hence the reason that the tax rate in this town has been split since 1982 which was the first year that it could be split um, and that is the major reason was to recover some of the um, loss of revenue tax revenue well it's been relative it seems to me like it's been relatively flat for the past 10 or 15 years yes, i don't has. think barbara anderson ever envisioned this type of situation happen in the I cranberry don't think industry barbara anderson even knew about cranberries no no <laughs> she lives on the north shore she did you know they and of course the town's not going to lose the revenue but it's the, the rest of the there. taxpayers that are going to you know be shouldering the burden and you talk about unfunded mandates well that's something that's imposed upon the rest of the citizens of the town you you would mention that the U united states government and the state government had subsidized 
Well, the way the state government operations. subsidizes is by lowering the value so that the tax burden on the But, on but it's the not the rest farmers. of the state that pays it. It's citizens of this town of each the tax town. Payers. Each town. Because each town has farmers. And, and I think you mentioned that it's open space, but I think, I don't know what Sarah would call it, but it's not really, what's it called, dedicated open space or, you know, whatever. If if I could, I guess I'm 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 not sure exactly what where we're going. But question for Ellen is the town not raising as much revenue from the farming community as it can under the law? No, it's raising mm. all that it can. Thank you. Oh, I, I, no. I, I wasn't yeah. sure what we were. The, the, the state imposes that, and like we said, it's Understood, like an yes. unfunded liability. Uh, right. Did you want funded mandate? Did you want to go somewhere with this, Jack? Or? No, I just wanted to bring it up and uh, have it be explained because it's a concern of mine that, you know, I, I heard so many people complain about their taxes being so high, and, and not that it's the cranberry growers' fault. It's just a function of the way state government and Barbara Anderson put this thing forward. Well, I think Barbara Anderson had a good thought with you know prop two and a half but you know and classification and which was a classification came from the state not from her but you know I, I it is what it is I'll keep it brief so so Ellen this chapter land Thank this chapter yes. 61 61 a 61 that's mass general law chapter 61 61 a yes so this but is state law mm -hmm. yes it is okay so having said that um, and, and I knew that I just wanted you to say it as, yes. as our assessor um, so that people could hear that and and what it's doing is it's providing for the farming community to allow them to keep their land in farming yes and one of the offsets of that is that it prevents it discourages them from selling off for residential dwellings which are exactly. actually tax negative because farms don't go to school etc cetera, etc cetera. indeed right so um, I, I guess I'm just curious why this is bring, being brought up now. Okay. I, I well, let me I, also just say, yeah. well, the that value credit sheet. You. Uh, the well, my I whole thing know, is But I just wanted to say about the value credits. That's the difference between Chapter 59, which is our valuation, and Chapter 61A values. So, and, and that's what the value credits are. Because first I have to, I have to come up with a market value for the bogs and the upland and the and the non-productive land and the difference between that and the FVAC values is what we call value credits and the reason I brought it up was when the school came before us they brought up about all these programs that are imposed upon them that are unfunded mm -hmm. and what I wanted to say was these are unfunded mandates on the taxpayers of this town you know granted we knew we moved into a rural community and it's to protect them from not selling their property but we pay a price for that. Exactly, well, we and here. and that and that's like moving next to an airport and wanting the airplanes yeah. to stop flying. To yeah. Same right. idea. Yeah. Okay, I think so, uh, ten so o'clock at night. I'm ready to go home. Thank I've you. had about all I can assimilate from that class. Was Thank that you, Aunt. Yes, I learned you something. I did. New growth yeah. now. I I learned a lot. Okay. Well, we have to do our new, little new growth seminar too. Yes. Okay. Yes. I'm old. You do uh, it. Whenever you're ready, after town meeting. <laughs> Oh, I have to wait. Huh? Please. Thank you. Thank Jack, you know. Jack, your points are duly noted. Um, request, well, no, they're not here tonight, right, Elaine? So we'll table that on the common victual license. Oh. Uh, discussion of process for hiring an interim town administrator. Um, I was, why is this on there? I thought we had tabled this. Not not tabled, but I thought we had um, made it the motion or what have you to have Rick and Jack Franey to work on. Well, it, yeah. yeah, we have been. Well, and if, if I may, Mr. Chair, the the bylaw actually stipulates that we, in the process of getting an interim town administrator, we have to actually set up a screening committee as right. well. I mean, that's right. in the bylaw. I've, I've asked for this to be on the agenda. Mm -hmm. Three times. This is the first time it's actually made it. No, I, I think the, uh, ch the the chairman had asked for a discussion. So if there was okay. some miscommunication okay. between the chairman and vice chairman, right. that could and be. And we just got our third applicant's resume. Yeah, correct. So we did, and I've since talked to um, Copeland and Page, Craig Gobo, Corbo, and um, 
I'm going to meet with him and the uh, managing partner. There's been a, a change, I guess, at Copeman and Page. Lauren Goldberg is now the managing partner, and they're going to meet with me and uh, go over the services that they can provide in selecting the, the interim town administrator. So we talked about that the other night. I came up to the zoning board meeting, and, and Greg was here, and we agreed that we'd meet around town meeting time. So. Well, why don't we do this? Why don't we put this on the next agenda and everybody come prepared with their recommendations for the screening committee and how we want to set that up and what we want to do with it, okay? In the meantime, maybe I'll have met with them right. and, and I can give you some... And give us some insight on it. Maybe the, it might even be worthwhile to bring them here or what have you. And maybe we'll have a few more resumes float in too, so... So you're talking about the second Tuesday in, in June. June? Yeah. Town meeting next week right yeah. right we get that behind us and then we can start to focus and, and bear in mind we don't we can't even bring a um, interim person on board until after july 1st because we don't have any funding available is that acceptable with everybody mm -hmm. sarah okay can i get a motion i'll make a motion that we uh, um, postpone that until uh, next selections meeting i'll second it get a motion in a second any further comments questions Concerns, recommendations, hearing none. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? What's that there? I'd like to do it now, but that's okay. You um, skipped over appointment of a representative to the Plymouth County Authority. Yes, I did. So Thank you. I'm getting tired, I guess. Getting I would make, I want to make a motion to, for purposes of discussion as well, appoint um, Jack Franey to the Plymouth County Advisory Board. Um, because of his experience with the county, um, I think he'd be a good fit for that role. Who, who, are you it now? I am. Mike is. I am. Yeah. Sorry, I'm being deposed. <laughs> well, it is an annual reappointment, so don't feel too. Uh, too and they did, you did get uh, a letter from the county, right? Yes, I did. <laughs> <laughs> um, no. Jack? I'll accept it. Anybody I worked for the county before. Anybody want to second that? You haven't been granted it yet. <laughs> I'll second it. Okay, we've got to leave it for someone else a second. Okay, we got a motion in a second. Uh, any further discussion? I know you're on the charter committee with them too, so maybe the two things will blend together. Yeah. And just as a, a point of information, I asked Elaine if she could round up all the appointments that we have to go through on an annual basis so that we could take a look at those maybe at our next meeting. Yes, she gives us the information, we can review it, maybe come the last week. The uh, last meeting of the month and make our votes and determinations. And how's that? Okay, we have a motion and a second uh, for Mr. Franey to be appointed as the um, Town of Carver's representative to the Plymouth County Advisory Board. Um, no further comments, questions, concerns? Very none. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? I aye. abstain. Three, four. One opposed, no. one abstention. Uh, what was that again? Three, four. Three, I'm sorry, three, one, one. Three, one, one. Yeah. I, I was adding. Good luck in your new post, Jack. Thanks. Okay, and this, here we go again. Discussion and possible vote regarding appointing a screening committee for a new town administrator. Um, we did. Yeah. Yeah. You're getting tired. Yeah, it's, Yep. Seven minutes ago, Mr. They, they kind of go hand in hand. Yep. <laughs> All right, can we bypass that? Yep. Request for sh use of Shirtlock Park Saturday, June 8th, 2013, by Don Ward for a birth birthday party, 1 p.m. to 4 p.m. I recommend we approve the request for Shirtlock Park on June 8th for the birthday party. We'll second it. We have a motion and a second. Any questions, comments, recommendations? Did you process all the paperwork? No conflicts, Elaine, or anything? With no, no, we do. Uh, no, there's, there's no conflicts. We're just discussing details, that's all. Okay. We have a motion and a second for the birthday party. Um, hearing no further comments, questions, concerns. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? It's unanimous. <clears throat> Mr. Chair, I just wanted a clarification. What was the vote on regarding the appointing the steering committee? I thought you voted to table those issues. My understanding mm -hmm. was that uh, the chairman requested that at the next regular meeting, 
that everybody come prepared to discuss their thoughts on the screening committee. Right. Uh, and in the meantime, uh, Mr. Franey was going to meet with the people from Copeland and Page to discuss the situation with the interim town administrator. So that was a 410 vote? 411. Uh, 311. No, that was the Plymouth County. No, that Advisor. was the Plymouth County. County. Okay, yeah. yeah, it was four. I thought it was five zero. It sounds like it's not. Gonna no, be that. I I didn't want to table it, so I was against. Oh, I just okay. wanted to know what the. It was four one zero. Four one zero. Okay, thank you. Four. Okay, next up, discussion of possible continuation of town meeting. This has been an ongoing saga. Make a motion we table. We don't. <laughs> Yeah, well, the reality is, is yeah. well, you know, we're, we're working with the school um, on some possible yeah. dates if necessary to continue it. I'm very confident that we'll get through it on June 3rd, but okay. I have a lot of faith in the All right, so Mr. Franny's made a recommendation that we just table this. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any further comments, questions, recommendations? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? It's unanimous. Approval of minutes, April 1, 4, 9, and 2023. 20, mm -hmm. Oh, my God. I make I, a motion we approve the minutes of April 1, 4, 9, and 23. Um, 1, 4, 9, and 23? Yeah. Yep. We were given the minutes a, a little while ago, a few Does weeks ago. Does anybody have any issues with those? I um, didn't even read them. Yeah, I actually, the only one I didn't get to was the 23rd. But for the others, I had very minor things. If you wanted okay. to look at them now, real, they're real short. Um, do you want to give them to Elaine for changes? Because I just heard Jack say he hasn't read them oh, you yet. You haven't looked at no. them either? Oh, okay. So. Certainly. Why don't you let her have your changes, Sarah, and then we'll just uh, put these on for the next meeting. Didn't Jack uh, give you a hard time, Rick, about having all the minutes I did. Up before you? Yeah. I did. Sorry about that. <laughs> and then he's, he's, he's been pretty tough on me. Yeah. All right. Next up is citizens' participation. Come on down, sir. Alan Dunham, 11 Ricard Street. Um, first off, I do want to thank you for putting, uh, honoring my request at the last meeting of uh, putting on the agenda the uh, reappointment of the police chief. Um, that was very nice of you to do. Um, I did have a couple of comments from that discussion. Um, there was a uh, concern. Um, my, my concern is that if the reappointment is not done in a timely fashion, one, where you're holding up a person knowing if they're going to continue to have a job. Two, if he's not reappointed by July 1st, you know, it's my opinion, and you, this is something you may want to check with the uh, council on, that basically you're terminating him without cause. Terminating without cause, my understanding is, and again, you'd want to, you know, since you're going to go to legal on this, is that the person will be eligible for the last two years of their contract because you're terminating without cause. Um, if the town wishes to fight that, then that allows the individual to then go ahead and also open more litigation for possible damages. I just see a very large legal bill coming if this is not done in a prudent and quick fashion. Also, uh, there was concern uh, voiced during the discussion while you were out, Mr. Chairman, uh, about the number of people leaving and you know, why people are leaving. I would just like to say, you know, there are actually lots of reasons why people choose to leave a job. Um, they could be looking for more money. Uh, they could be looking for uh, a greater challenge. Um, they could also, um, you know, looking for a better work environment. I almost, I tried to leave a job, I attempted to leave a job once because in the job environment was becoming less pleasurable. It was becoming a hostile work environment. Mm -hmm. So that's another reason somebody would, you know, could be possibly looking for another job. So there are many reasons for, you know, people would go ahead and leave jobs. Having said that, I respectfully request that the reappointment of Police Chief be put on the agenda for the next regularly scheduled meeting. I believe that'll be uh, June 10th. Uh, the Board of Selectmen, I and I also strongly encourage that the Board do the right thing and reappoint the Police Chief for at least the final two years of his contract. But it would be kind of a nice thing and fitting and reflective of his past job performance to reappoint him for three years. I thank you for your time, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you. 
Anyone else? Joe? Hi, my name is Joe Ritz. I'm a police officer here in town. For those of you that don't know, I started with the police department in 1993. I was appointed a special police officer 20 years ago. I started my full-time career in 2005. And we all know the police department's had ups and downs over the years. Mm -hmm. There's no secret. But one thing I will say, and I know I'm speaking for the majority of the police department, in my tenure there as a full-time officer, right now, the police department, under Chief, Le Chief Mix's leadership, is running as smooth and as efficient as it ever has. For him to be questioned the way he's been questioned just appalls me and it appalls a lot of my brother officers. He's doing a great job under the circumstances that he's been chief. We've been in a financial crisis, as everyone knows, since Chief Mix has been chief. He has done a fantastic job keeping our department moving forward, making right decisions, being responsible under the limited resources that he has. Failing to reappoint a chief like Mike, Mike Mix is, is a big, big mistake. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Something different, Mike? Mike Shaw, 8 Deer Helene. I also work in the police station as a dispatcher. And, uh, you know, I feel it's, it is a wrong decision for the town not to reappoint Mr. Mix. There's no confusion there. There shouldn't be. Mr. Mix has done a great job in this town, and he deserves a reappointment for at least two years, if not three. If there's confusion, it needs to be figured out by you guys. You know, he's done a great job. I appreciate all the work he's done for me, and that's that's basically all I have to say. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Anybody else? Good evening, Dennis Rizzuto. I'm also a uh, police officer and a taxpayer here in Carver. I would uh, echo the sentiments of my colleague, Sergeant Joe Ritz. I just wanted to point something out that's painfully obvious to me and I would hope it would be to anyone who might hear what I'm about to say. But the town of Hanson embarked on a chief hiring process some time ago, uh, expended I'm quite sure a great deal of funds in that process, hiring an assessment board. Uh, took applications and applicants from all over the Commonwealth. And in that process, with the assessment board, which I believe is largely made up of retired law enforcement chiefs in particular, um, they came up with, typically they would come up with three candidates. As I understand it, and this is my understanding of it, in this particular instance, the two top candidates, Chief Mix and a lieutenant from New Bedford, rated so highly in the process that they didn't even consider a third person. Um, the other applicant who was initially offered the job wound up taking a job elsewhere, I would suspect, because that community chose to capitalize on the process that Hanson had spent all their time, money, and effort on. and. Um, hired that candidate. Now I read the same newspapers that everybody else does, and I hear things that many of us also hear. And I don't think it's any secret that, you know, Chief Mix obviously is in a position where he could accept the job in Hanson, and I will be totally candid. I do not know what, what his intentions are, quite frankly. Um, I sincerely hope his, in, his intentions would be to stay here in a community that he has spent his entire law enforcement career in, in a variety of capacities. I have had a total of eight police chiefs in my 
20 year career, nearly 20 years now, in my 20th year, 13 here in Carver. And as many of us could, we've had good bosses, not so good bosses, average bosses, and so on. And I've had some pretty good police chiefs over the years. But as far as someone who is as trustworthy as they come, I mean, if if Chief Mix tells you something, um, he, he means it. And from a labor standpoint, you know, oftentimes labor 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 and management um, are kind of adversarial uh, in adversarial positions, oftentimes. But under Chief Mix's leadership, there has really been a, a concerted effort to overcome much of that. And I think we've collectively, between labor and management, have done a great job doing that. Um, I can point to the fact that in his tenure, we have managed to resolve n numerous unresolved issues, some of which had lingered for years, have uh, been resolved. And to my knowledge at this point, there really aren't any outstanding issues. I mean, we're, we're finally at a point where we can move forward for the betterment of the department and the community. And yes, we've, you know, we have lived under the budget constraints that every other town office has lived with for the past many years now. And despite that, we have managed to accomplish some great things um, with respect to policing the town and um, you know I just feel like we're really poised to really just go forward leaps and bounds at this point and I think failure to reappoint Chief Mix would be detrimental quite frankly to that cause um, and put the town in a position where it will expend thousands of dollars on the proverbial nationwide search to come up with somebody who has already rated one of the top two guys there is right now out there, at least as far as Hanson was concerned. So, you know, it's just, I'm kind of at a loss. I, I don't understand why we wouldn't just seize on that as taxpayers and for myself as not only a taxpayer but a police officer. So I would just uh, sincerely hope that the board would move forward in that direction and reappoint Chief Mix, and in a timely fashion. I, I mean, you know, I don't know how much longer he's uh, going to be in a position to wait for a decision, because if, in fact, what I suspect is going on is going on, I think he's going to have to make a decision relatively quickly. Uh, on whether or not he'd even be in a position, even be available any longer. So, I think I've covered just about everything I'd thank like you. to say. So, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Anything else? Thanks, Dad. Seeing none, we're going to move on to town administrative notes. A couple things, Mr. Chairman. First, a. Uh, Three points. First, it was mentioned earlier in the evening, um, alluding to some unprofessional conduct, perhaps coming from the town administrator's office. And I would just like to suggest that, with regard to the annual audit, this office did everything it's done historically, and to have done otherwise may have been termed scandalous by some, even. So, um, now to the nice stuff. This may be the last meeting that I'm involved in in this forum. There'll be other meetings, obviously, for town meeting, and who knows what special meetings may come up in the meantime. So I'm not going to read the speech I wrote. I'm going <laughs> to put that on, on file with the town clerk's office at some point. Um, but I do want to, uh, I will find an appropriate way to, to, to have some sort of comments, um, you know, in more depth. But I do want to thank this board. I want to thank the board of selectmen, all the members of the board that I've worked with over the years. I have worked with some of the most amazing public servants in this town that you could ever imagine. 
and uh, any town would be proud to have some of the people that I've had the pr privilege to work with on the Board of Selectmen and Carver. Um, the department heads, the staff level people, just a remarkable group of people over the years. We've had some issues here and there, some bumps in the road. Um, I've caused some of those bumps occasionally, and I think I've tried to pick up my, my tracks as best I could. Um, <clears throat> but without belaboring this too much, I want to thank the board. I want to thank the uh, citizens of Carver who have treated me so well for so long. And um, like I say, this isn't the time for tears, but I, I certainly do want to at least acknowledge in probably the last real forum I'll have uh, my real deep gratitude to the citizens of this town people that I've worked with, <coughs> board members. Um, and um, the last point I want to say <coughs> is uh, well said, Dennis. Um, and I agree with your points. And I assume the selectmen are going to deal with those in a timely fashion at this point. So um, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Down at the uh, selectmen notes. Anybody want to kick it off? I will. Um, on a on a bittersweet note, I just want you to know that um, dealing with um, employee issues is always sensitive, no matter where you work. And I just want to you to know that if anybody wants to talk to me about any of the decisions I'm making, I cannot emphasize enough. Especially after this evening, it was a little bit difficult to even get. Um, a kind of a sentence in in terms of the um, where I was coming from please feel free to call me um, to talk one-on-one -on -one where it, it's um, always a little bit more um, it's easier to talk and discuss why I personally make decisions that I make it's sometimes um, people get very emotional in these meetings and I've in the police chief situation is I've always had a good relationship with Mike Mishka and this has nothing to do with his his um, his work ethic or what he has done for the the, pol the the town itself and the police department I know what he's done this all has to do with the understanding of the contract etc and hopefully we can move forward with that soon um, I also want to congratulate all the high school seniors uh, for their upcoming graduation and I know several of them and I just know what great kids they've all turned out to be and I wish you all um, great fortune and success in your next part of your journey in life so that's about it and Rick thank you thank you for everything thank you for all of your insight on things as especially in my first year so well, I wish you the very life. best in the town of Abington Thank you, Helen Dick. Um, yep. Uh, first, I uh, wanted to mention Memorial Day. Mm -hmm. I thought the small town parade went awesome. very well, and uh, I wanted to thank everybody um, that helped. And uh, the band sounded great. Yeah. Um, you did keep saying that. <laughs> I did. They were very they clear. Were awesome. they, they did. They did a great job. Um, I uh, want to thank Rick for, I've been working with him for six years, and um, I find him to be uh, very honorable, and he's highly respected in Massachusetts in his, his position, and he's a good family man, and I uh, have a lot of respect, and I, I'm very sad to see you go. Um, that's a wrap. <laughs> Sarah? Thank you. Yeah, I want to uh, agree with Dick about the Memorial Day Parade and all the participants, um, police, uh, police and fire, DPW, buildings and grounds, the high school band, um, the veterans. It was a wonderful parade. I, um, I also want to say something about Rick and his years of service. Um, it's it's a, it's going to be a great loss to the town, Rick. And um, <clears throat> I don't think a lot of people understand that yet, but they will. We, and we're really going to miss you. Um, I also want to thank uh, the chief, the police chief, and the members of the police department who came here tonight to 
to speak up and to be here and to be a presence. Uh, I agree with you. I think it's about time. It's past due that we should have appointed Chief Nix, reappointed him. And I appreciate your taking a stand. Um, and then I want to encourage people to come to town meeting June 3rd. That's this Monday at 7 p.m. this coming Monday at the uh, Carver Middle High School Auditorium. Your vote does matter. Thank you. Thank you. Jack? Well, I want to wish Rick the best of luck because uh, out of anyone in this room, I was sitting on the member of the Board of Selectmen. I helped collaborate with my brother Rick to help bring you here. And unfortunately, I collaborated with my brother Mike to send you back to Abington. <laughs> so, and I'll tell you something. I would never think of you as being scandalous or unprofessional because I've worked with you too many years and I've worked with too many other town administrators. Uh, I would never want to sit in your seat. You know, anyone that thinks that they can sit and be town administrator has got another thing to learn, to deal with all these different personalities all the time. So I wish you the best of luck. I know with my brother Mike sitting on the board of selectmen up there, at least you'll have one ally up there. So. The well, other I thing is, I won't be thanking you in a year. Not cursing <laughs> you, <so>. He'll be <laughs> cursing me. <laughs> uh, I also want to remind people to come to town meeting. It's a very important town meeting, and like Sarah said, every vote counts. And um, I wasn't able to attend the um, the parade on uh, Monday, but I think the town has a lot to be proud of. Other, much larger communities are actually canceling their parades, but we still seem to go on and on and. I, I would think even if you didn't have veterans to march in the parade, each community still has to show their appreciation to all the men and women that have stood up for our Constitution and defended us and give us these types of freedoms that we enjoy. Um, I, I do want to mention that uh, the graduation for the high school is Sunday uh, at noontime. In case any of the selectmen hadn't received this, I'll make photocopies for you. All set? Yep. Couple of things. I want to echo my colleagues' comments about the Memorial Day parade. Uh, it was very well done. Ron Delano does a super job with that, putting that together. And uh, there was uh, good citizen participation, and it was nice to see them come out and recognize uh, veterans, especially those that have made the ultimate sacrifice, so that we may have the uh, the lives that we have today. Um, I want to echo the emphasis on town meeting. That's your opportunity to come out and have a say in how your community is governed. Um, please come out and join us. Um, last time we almost had a problem getting a quorum. So we need folks to come out and take an active interest in the, in the community. Some of us are getting old, long in the tooth, and uh, we need some young, young people to step up and, take over. Rick, I too want to thank uh, thank you. I know you've been here, what, 16, almost 17 years? 17. Yeah. And uh, we've, we've worked together for eight of those years. Um, done a commendable job. Um, you're going back to a place you were familiar with. Yes. And it uh, looks, looks like they're welcoming you with open arms, so uh, that'll be Cobb's loss and Abington's gain, I suspect. So best of luck to you and your family. Um, fair winds and following seas. Um, last thing I want to say is uh, just make sure that we keep uh, our servicemen and women in your thoughts and prayers and uh, pray to bring them home safe and soon. And uh, God bless you. Um, God bless the town of Carver and God bless the United States of America. And at this time we're going to uh, we're going to convene or we're going to end the regular town regular selectmen's meeting and we're going to convene an executive session um, to conduct strategy strategy sessions with respect to collective bargaining i suspect something along those lines yes um, right the uh, be, be, uh, consider the approval of minutes executive session minutes and to discuss strategy with regard to collective bargaining of um, pertaining to the police DP, P, dpw and clerical contracts is an open meeting may have a detrimental effect on the bargain. Okay. So moved. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor, roll call Aye. vote. Aye. 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 Okay. Thank you, folks.
folks. Thank you.